to the field of renal palliative care, um, the supportive care for the renal patient, which was published in 2004, so 15 years ago. And in that preface, we wrote that renal replacement treatment with dialysis or transplantation is one of the miracles of modern medicine, and I think we'd all agree with that. But really what we went on to say that there's really much more to the care and management of people on dialysis and transplants than just the technology. We also need to think about sustaining um, um, and extending their quality of life as well as their length of life. And we finished with the statement that extending life because we can is not acceptable. And although these statements are now 15 years old, I think they're just as true today as they were then. And the one thing that we tend to forget is that we're all going to die. So this is um, an artwork from um, the Whitney Museum in New York. Um, it's, it's a giant candle. You can probably just see the light at the, on his head. And um, at the end of the, the blurb that went with this was that at the end of the exhibition, this candle will have disappeared, as we all will. Fortunately, our lifespan is more than the three months of the exhibition, but we are all going to die. And this is an article that was written a few years ago um, by The Lancet, End of Life Care, the Neglected Core Business of Medicine. We spend a lot of time thinking about the treatment of chest infections, very you know, rare syndromes, but end of life is going to happen for every single one of our patients and people that we look after. And we should really think about how we manage that and make it as high quality as possible, because that is how we remember our loved ones. So here's a patient story. It was a 79-year-old Afro-Caribbean man who started on peritoneal dialysis in 2010. He went on a cruise, did two trips to visit his family in St. Kitts. I do an annual review with my patients, um, you know, obviously once a year, um, and as part of that, I get them to think about what would they wish at the end of life when they're really ill and can no longer make their own decisions. And what he always said was that if he was terminally ill and no chance of being independent, he wanted treatment to stop. So after um, two really very good years with PD, um, he developed severe heart failure, aortic stenosis, required um, aortic valve replacement. He never got back to where he was, but he did manage um, another trip to see his family in the Caribbean. Then in January 14, by this point he's about 83 years old, he's admitted with confusion um, and he's becoming demented. He's discharged home doing CAPD, which his wife is now having to do, and support from the palliative care team. A few months later he's admitted because the wife can no longer cope, semi-comatose, doesn't recognize the PD nurses, there's a family meeting. The wife does not want to stop dialysis. She wants absolutely everything done um, for, the, for her husband. It's a second marriage, um, and the children belong to the first wife, and they were very clear that we must respect dad's wishes. Dialysis was stopped, and he had a very peaceful death um, four days later with his family around him. So he had a good quality death. And this story really represents the pathway of end-of-life decision-making from full continued care to withholding treatment. And withholding treatment isn't just dialysis. It's should we be doing that bypass operation? Should we be starting them in chemotherapy for a newly diagnosed cancer, etc., to actually withdrawing treatment such as dialysis? Um, and then finally, end-of-life management. So a good quality of death, good quality death has been defined in a document that came out um, in the UK as characteristics of care during the last days of life, which are important from the patient's perspective, are receiving adequate pain and symptom management, avoiding inappropriate prolongation of dying, achieving a sense of control, relieving burden on loved ones, and strengthening relationships with loved ones. So how do we achieve that? It's really with patient-centered and supportive care, a realistic awareness of life on dialysis, predicting the prognosis, recognizing end of life, being able to communicate and plan for the future, and then thinking about the last few days. 
So one of the things that I am always teaching um, trainees and medical students, and this has been reinforced in the new guideline from that the ISPD is bringing out in terms of prescribing, is that patients do not like being called patients. We should think of them as people and persons. As soon as you talk about a patient, it, you dehumanize somebody. And this is a, a wonderful painting that um, was done um, by, uh, just after the First World War. Um, and in the front, you can see a rather sort of overweight, pleased bureaucrat. Um, and behind him is, is a um, disabled German war veteran. The bureaucrat is meant to be looking after the care um, and improving life for the German war veteran, but clearly he's more interested in his rules, guidelines, and everything else, um, and, and his own life. So supportive care um, is, during the advanced kidney disease is not just at the end of life. We need to be thinking about um, supporting people to achieve the goals and the life that they want throughout their time with any long-term condition. And obviously, as time goes on and aggressive treatment becomes less and less effective, supportive care becomes more important. And it goes on into bereavement. We need to think about how um, those who are left behind um, are managing and give them support as well. And you heard from Magda Yacoub um, in his talk um, earlier this morning about um, the, the service of remembrance that they have at the Royal London. Um, and I was really very powerfully impressed by that. So a few years ago, um, there was um, an article about patient-centered vision of care for end-stage renal disease. And we're really talking very much about dialysis, not as a bridging to transplantation, but we're talking about dialysis as a final destination. Most of our older patients and many of our younger ones um, where transplantation isn't common, they're going to be on dialysis and they're going to die. Um, so dialysis is really a palliative treatment during the end of life phase. That doesn't, end of life phase is not just the days or the weeks. End of life phase can be years. Um, and we really need to think about maximizing the quality of that time for the patient and their family, or for the person and their family. And the treatment goals for um, dialysis as a final destination are really to um, maximize the holistic support, um, thinking about rehabilitation, thinking about psycho-spiritual support, not doing unnecessary investigations, not doing unnecessary interventions that are going to have limited or pot potentially even negative impacts on the lifestyle and quality of life of the person you are looking after. So I think we need to be really um, very aware of what life is like on dialysis. Pretty grim. Um, it can be successful. Some people can feel very well. We all have um, people that we look after doing, doing that. But when we're talking about multimorbid, particularly older people, um, and as the data again that Magdi discussed um, earlier on, life isn't like that. And the concept of frailty is really important. So I'm not going to go in huge um, depth about that, but frailty is really the difference between Mrs. A, who's aged 80, who's clearly very fit, does going swimming, um, and Mrs. B, who is um, at the end of life, requiring a walker, um, looking very emaciated, malnourished, very frail, um, and is definitely going to die fairly soon. And the other important aspect of frailty is the increased vulnerability. And we need to think about that whenever um, we're thinking about active interventions in, in our um, people that we look after on dialysis. So the green line is when somebody, you know, you or I um, get um, a minor illness, we, we, we have a little blip, um, we may not feel so well, we may not be quite so physically active, but we get better very quickly. Somebody who's frail, that's the red line, that doesn't happen. Um, they become more dependent, 
the period of being unwell is longer and they don't get back to where they were before. And that has a major impact on the trajectory towards the end of life. So the blue line is people with cancer, so they have a good, you know, fairly you know, good quality of life, fairly physically active um, until almost the end. The red dotted line is organ failure, like heart failure, respiratory failure, where you have a downward trend with um, blips going down, representing acute events. And frailty is bumping along the bottom, um, some good days, some bad days, um, but really, um, again, um, going down towards the end of life. And frailty is also the predominant association with quality of life measures. So this is a study that um, I led on in the UK, um, comparing people on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis in frail older people. Um, there were about 250 patients um, who were included in that. And um, frailty was the predominant association with all the measures of quality of life um, and not the dialysis modality apart from the fact that patients on hemodialysis had a lower treatment satisfaction than those on peritoneal dialysis. So the next step is to think about predicting prognosis and recognizing end of life. So this is one of my favorite paintings. Um, it's done by a German Renaissance painter called Cronach, Fountain of Youth. And on the left, you see the old decrepit people going into the um, pool and coming out looking young and beautiful. Um, and many, um, and we tend as physicians and healthcare workers to get um, people and their families to think that that's what dialysis is going to achieve. I, I've had, I remember vividly one man in his 70s who when I asked him what's really bothering you, he says I can't walk. He hadn't walked for 10 years and he, because since he'd had a major stroke and he thought that going on dialysis, he'd start walking again. So we really need to, uh, I mean, it's sad, it's dreadful, that story. And he really suffered towards the end with an ITU stay and everything else. So this is a statement from Hippocrates. The physician who cannot inform his patient what would be the probable issue of his complaint is not qualified to prescribe any rational treatment for its cure. So there are now many ways um, that we can actually try and put figures or, of risk of people starting on dialysis, something that we as good clinicians should be able to do without having to use computer scores. But people like computer scores. And I think particularly for younger people who don't have quite the same experience, um, they can be very useful. So this was one of the first from the French registry um, and, and having any of the conditions on the slide, really uh, no surprise that they have a bad prognosis. There's been another method of trying to um, look at prognosis, this is from the States, where they use the surprise question, would you be surprised if this person in front of you was no longer going to be alive? I think in this situation it was six months. Um, and they used various other things as well. Um, and as, as you can see, the more of those risk factors you had, the lower the chance that you were going to be alive at two years' time. And I often use that when I'm talking to people and their families. I may say, if I asked myself the question, would I be surprised if you were no longer with us in a year's time? The answer would be no. And then I immediately qualify that by saying, that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily die in the next year, it means there's a chance that could happen, but it does, it does mean that this is an opportunity to think about what treatment do you really want? What are you living for? What do you want to achieve? And how do you want your treatment to be when you're at the end of life? You're not going to get better. We want to be able to do what you wish for. So I'm going to really move on to thinking about communication and advanced care planning. So there are many opportunities in renal medicine when we can and should have these discussions. 
So any older person, multi-morbid person approaching dialysis, we should be having realistic conversations about what dialysis is going to be like, either modality, and what their life, likely lifespan is going to be. When transplants fail, um, again, this is another opportunity. When people are on peritoneal dialysis and patient may not be able to transfer to hemodialysis, either for resource reasons or because they don't want to or they don't have, have potential access. Recurrent vascular access problems in people on hemodialysis who can't have any other options. And really important is when people have other events. So if somebody has had a stroke or a cardiac event, or they've had a fall and a fracture, all of those give us opportunities to have these conversations. So what is advanced care planning? It's a bit of a buzzword in, 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 this, in renal palliative care or palliative care in general. There's nothing complicated about it. It's just discussions, communication. It's not um, with the patient and the family about prognos prognosis and realistic impact of treatment. Thinking about treatment of symptoms, including pain, really important to allow time to answer questions. Thinking ahead to get the patient to be able to um, say what their goals are, what their acceptable ceilings of care are and place of care and cultural sensitivity. We all come from different cultures um, so that the discussions can be attuned to the needs of the person in front of you and their family. So this is something that I have embedded into my annual review. So I'm talking about how the dialysis is going, what's their chance of getting a transplant, how long should they stay on PD, should they think of changing to hemo, and then the conversation naturally moves into what would your wishes be if and when, because it's going to happen to all of us, you are really ill and you can't make your own decisions. And I find that about 60% of people, and remember I look after a very multicultural group of people, um, because we, we, I think we estimated at once that there are about 100 languages spoken in our renal unit. And um, I find that about 60% of people have already thought of this and are absolutely delighted and thank me at the end of the conversation to say that you are the first person who's ever raised this. Then there's about 20% who haven't thought about it, but are actually very pleased that the subject has been brought up and will go away and come back with, and bring it up again next time I see them. And then there's about 20% who just aren't interested, don't want to talk about it. And obviously the first time, you can't push the envelope, but you can, you have at least dropped the seed and you have given the information about, poor pro, about prognosis and likely events in the future and the limitations of dialysis. So there have been randomized controlled trials. You'd think that this would be pretty difficult to do, but this is an Australian study, which was actually published a few years ago um, and they randomized about 300 people to advanced care planning or not. And then um, 56 of the people died within the six next six months. So these were all people over the age of 80 who were being ad um, admitted to medical wards. And they found that the advanced care planning improved end of life care, patient and family satisfaction. And these are just some of the um, statements um, so these are the um, family members' responses of people who died. Um, so this is the people who had had um, advanced care planning. We had a clear plan so could just relax and enjoy time with dad. He had a very peaceful death. And then those who were in the control group, they wouldn't let her go. They kept doing tests and things she would not have wanted. So let's now just focus on the last few days. So lots of things matter in the last few days and affect quality of dying, culture, um, place of death, avoidance of unnecessary treatments, symptom control, diagnosis of the last few days and communication. So my second story, 76-year-old man who'd been on peritoneal dialysis for three years, multimorbid, lived with his daughter, 
um, who did the PD. Um, he was needing more and more help at home, and again, with his yearly conversations, he had always said that he did not want heroic management or a lingering death, and he did not want resuscitation. He's then admitted with pulmonary edema, um, and then I discover that he's been transferred to the ITU, and I'm doing a, my dialysis clinic, and the daughter is pacing backwards and forwards outside my room, absolutely petrified that father is in ITU, and could I please go and do something about it? So um, in, in the end, what happened was that he, he left the ITU. Um, I then discovered he was on the cardiology treadmill, and somebody was deciding that the, he was going to have coronary artery bypass grafting. Um, again, we highlighted his previous wishes. Um, he did agree to some stenting just in case it improved his pulmonary edema, which it didn't, and he then decided to stop dialysis, and he died three days later. So dialysis withdrawal is always a very tricky subject. Um, there was a meeting from Kay Daigo um, in Mexico City um, about five years ago now, um, and it was published in Kidney International. So the conclusion of this meeting was that withdrawal from dialysis is ethically and clinically acceptable after the process of shared decision making. And it's incumbent upon all providers caring for people contemplating to stop dialysis to address before you make the decision about withdrawal that there's um, remedial factors um, such as depression and symptom control have been addressed. So patients with decision-making capacity, being fully informed, making voluntary choices, may refuse dialysis or request that dialysis be dishonored and be discontinued. So these are the various situations where um, they considered dialysis withdrawal was acceptable. But the key statement was that ensuring access to appropriate supportive and or hospice care is an integral part of care following the decision to withdraw dialysis. So does dialysis withdrawal happen everywhere? Obviously not. And this was a study um, that was done um, through um, the European Renal Best Practice Group, which showed along the bottom axis is where countries um, which stopped, where stopping life-prolonging treatment is allowed, um, and the left of the vertical axis is the number of people who withdraw from dialysis. And this was done by a survey to nephrologists. And as you can see, that in the more, um, the greater number of uh, patients are able to withdraw from dialysis in countries where stopping life-prolonging treatment is allowed. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that what I've been talking about, advanced care planning, um, shared decision making is all about patient autonomy and this is very much um, and I'm sure you, you agree with me is very much a concept of medical ethics that exists predominantly in the English speaking world so in North America the UK some parts of Northern Europe um, and, and Australia but there's the rest of the world very much has there's their main principles of ethics, filial piety, beneficence, religious beliefs, and family decision-making. So really very different to what I've been talking about. But when we think about that, let's just, you know, we can still use all of those to be able to enable our, the people that we look after to have a good quality of dying. So filial piety, um, which is very common in um, South um, East Asia, um, it can also be turned on its head. So you can say to people, you, you're taking fantastic care of your elderly mother, father, or, or whoever, but they are now dying, and we need to think about how they would have wanted that period of life to be. Patient autonomy I've addressed. Family decision making, again, is going to be much more common in this part of the world than in the UK and the US. And it is it really, then that's one of the questions that I always ask is who makes the decisions? And these decisions can be made with the family as well as with the individual in front of you. But the strongest problem is, it's not really a problem, is religious belief. 
so that the Almighty decides. And that's often a barrier to withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. However, you can still talk to the family about prognosis, about um, suffering, and you know, is this how your loved one would have wanted to spend their last few days? And in my own experience, I find that if you start the conversations early, then the barriers at the end, in terms of going on with what we as physicians regard as unnecessary treatment, are much less. And I don't have a slide of this story, but I was looking after um, a very elderly, dementing um, man who I couldn't communicate with. They were Pakistani in, in origin. And he was on peritoneal dialysis, looked after by his daughter, who would never engage in any conversations at all. But twice I tried to have the conversation, and I always told them about the prognosis. He was then admitted under the geriatric team with falls, and I got an email from the geriatric team saying, thank you, know, thank you for all the palliative care conversations that you had. The daughter has accepted these and has taken father home and has agreed that she will manage him at home and further hospital admissions are not indicated. So he, in fact, had a very peaceful end um, at home. So I'm going to really wrap up at this point um, because of time, and I'm going to leave you with, with this picture here, which is Rembrandt's um, Jacob blessing the sons of Joseph. A good quality death is when somebody can die with their family, say their goodbyes, pass things on, and by medicalizing that end of life, we are denying that memory to um, the families and the loved ones left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Edwina, uh, we may have time to, for one quick question, please, if anyone. Yes, uh, Professor Mustafa Kadri. The multicultural team that you have on dialysis in your uh, unit. So what, what are the, I would be interested in knowing uh, the people with the Pakistani background, uh, how amenable are they uh, in, in, in London to uh, advance directives uh, in your experience on dialysis? It, it is it's very variable and, and it, it often depends um, how long that they have been in the country, um, whether the children um, are now um, British, as it were, have had British educations, um, and, and, and whether they speak English or not. So I've given you the example of the, uh, well, the, the daughter of this man whom I couldn't communicate with, but she would not engage in any conversations at all, but had accepted that he had a poor prognosis and eventually um, agreed to a peaceful end under palliative care support. I've just had another um, Pakistani family where um, he was on assisted, on, he was on per, also on peritoneal dialysis. Um, and again, I had the conversation and was told that um, he already had a note on his fridge door that he did not want to be resuscitated. Um, and he came in having had a fall and fractured femur, um, and we had a very good family discussion, and we withdrew dialysis. Um, and, and again, I had an email of thanks. And, all the, and what was really nice about that one was that all the family was scattered all over the world and they had an opportunity to fly into the UK and be with um, the father while he died. So question, uh, do you have the conversation like a week or month ago or do you also have conversation like three years ago or four years ago when you can see that this person is going to have only three years approximately plus minus? Uh, do you have that kind of conversation very early like a year or two year or three year ago, but that we can see you declining and you may be 45, you may not be 80 year old, that kind of. 
I didn't actually, because of the acoustics, I didn't catch absolutely everything you said, but I think you're wanting to know when I have the conversations, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Now for shield distribution, I would uh, ask Professor Mustafa Kadir to come forward. Sir, please come forward and present the shield to Madam. Dr. Irvina Brown. Madam, come forward. Session is ended now. Thank you all for your participation in this session. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Omar Sabir. I am currently working as assistant professor uh, in Department of Nephrology in Fatma Memorial Hospital. It is my privilege to moderate this session for you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Abira Mansoor uh, to come on stage. She's a consultant nephrologist in Doctors Hospital, and she'll be the chair for this session. I'll also like to request uh, Dr. Amir Azhar, uh, who is a, a professor of Department of Nephrology in Khyber Medical Teaching uh, Hospital, Peshawar, to please come on the stage. Uh, he'll be the co-chair. Along with these two, I would also request Lieutenant Colonel Zahid Farooq Beg, uh, who's a consultant nephrologist in CMH, to please arrive on the stage. Thank you, sir. My pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Saeed Ahmed, who is a consultant nephrologist at City Hospital, and he has a keen interest in interventional, radi interventional nephrology, and he leads a training program for ST3, and um, he is, uh, has mapped this to the new renal curriculum as well. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone, and uh, I'd like to just thank you, the organizers of PSN, and also the members of the chair team today. It's a great honor for me to come to this country and present some of the work that we are doing in the UK, and we're learning so much from the audience here that this has been a really remarkable meeting for us and my colleagues as well. So there's two talks I'm going to give today, and the first one is on artificial intelligence. So just to get a feel in the room and from the chair people, hands up if you know what artificial intelligence means. Wow, so a lot of people know it already. That's great. So that talk means I can finish really early. So artificial intelligence is in there, and this is the usual feeling when we do something like this. This is my background, as already been alluded to. This is the feeling you get. You get this, some sort of movie that you're going to watch about artificial intelligence or it's something about taking your jobs over. We're all worried about our work and jobs and computers are going to take them over. However, you all trust computers. All of you will have a smartphone in your pocket right now. The smartphone in your pocket right now has a computer power which is more than the Apollo 11 space mission. I, the power in that computer is so high. You trust it more than many other things and without realizing it as well. So we're going to just dissect that out a little thing. Currently, we live in this age. Everything is connected to everything. Global, village, small area. I come from the UK. I can be here. I can uh, travel around the world. WhatsApp is everywhere. Messages are flying around the world. You are all part of the system without even knowing that you are in the system itself. So Internet of Things is where we are right now. And data is the big issue. Everybody wants data. So in the developed world and the developing world is all about data. So the developed world, we have electronic health records. If you like them or you don't like them, we're going paperless. And in this part of the world, you will follow, I'm sure you will follow with data systems. And you're all part of putting that data in. As you put that data in, somebody can use that data, either preferentially, hopefully, or maybe they may use it, uh, you know, not preferentially. So it's big data is important. This is the definition of artificial intelligence. It's a bit more than we think. It is not 
what a lot of people think an algorithm. It's not an algorithm. The definition is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation, but it's self-learning algorithm. And that is the main key point. Who has designed this? Now, obviously, in this part of the world, faith is very important, and there's an almighty design as well. But this design is started off as human, but then it has a mind of its own. And I'll explain that, because that becomes a, a key issue. Who has designed this, and who is at fault when it goes wrong? So the story starts back in with Alan Turing. So in World War II, we had the Enigma system. This was used to crack the code for the Nazi invasion. And that's where computer systems then started doing, making codes, making codes that could break other people's codes. And he's known as the father of modern computing in the form of artificial intelligence. But it is pertinent. This is from the Royal College only this year. Everybody's talking about it. Every week there are documents and uh, loads of new articles on artificial intelligence. Either you like it or hate it, you need to know something about it, but it cannot be black box technology, where you leave it to the system. And already now you see on ward rounds, people say, have you Googled it? You find a diagnosis, have you Googled it? But who's putting stuff into the Google? Where is it coming from? Where's the evidence base? But a lot of patients, more than doctors, will Google something and come to you in your practice and say, I've read this, can we do this? Okay. So everybody's doing it. Clinically, and, and if you analyze your own work, 12% of jobs in healthcare, especially in the modern world, are very monotonous, can easily be taken over by automated systems. And these are jobs that which are, can be automated in the next 10 years very easily. So 12% of your workforce is at risk. Suggested that in uh, 2017, a paper suggested that 60% of jobs have at least a 30% of tasks which are automatable. So therefore, you can save time. And in the modern world, efficiency is important. Your managers will tell you, we need to have more efficiency. And then we move on to the NHS. We have a lot of nurses in the NHS. We're short of nurses. We have 2.5 million hours a week on clerical tasks alone for an NHS staff. So this is in the UK where we come from. Those can easily be changed and removed, allowing NHS staff to do what we really need to do, which is be with the patient and do the patient care. In our system, governance is so important, it is not done until it's documented. So documentation takes a lot of time. It takes you away from the patient care. And if we can remove that a little bit, then we can do better patient care, do what Professor Edwina Brown is suggesting, but spend more time with the patient. So this will be the push from efficiency from managers and reducing time on computers. So it does make a little bit of sense that we should do this. But how does it work? As I said to you, it's not an algorithm. You've all heard of uh, self-driving cars. You've all heard of automated systems that are out there. In my part of the world, they're already existing. You know, you believe in GPS navigation. You believe in many things that you are subconsciously using, but you don't know how they work. So artificial intelligence in this way, and I will not go into a lot of detail, relies on artificial neural net networks. And that is, you feed it mega data. So here in this case, how a Google car drives itself, all they do is get every bit of information they can from driving a car, put it into a high resolution artificial network, then into a, a, another deep minded network, and the car drives itself. I'll leave it at that because we're not going to get into the maths of it. But that's what, the, so somebody out there needs a mega data. And guess who they are? Google, Facebook, Amazon, and you all use it, you provide the data. You are all working for the mega data companies without you knowing it. And where does that data go? You think it's in your pocket. It's not. It's in a server or in a cloud server somewhere in the world. You have no control over it. If you talk about end-to-end -end encryption and nobody's watching you. They are watching you. So what happens? Artificial neural networks. Training an artificial neural network needs mega data. In our healthcare system, the push is to go electronic. I understand that. I like it. But when you've got electronic data, that can be sold to private sector. And the private sector in our part of the world are sold that data through our governments. And the governments sell that mega data to them for they can use it to drive their artificial neural networks, to create those algorithms, and then the algorithms then self-drive themselves. Okay? So they need a lot of data, and then they need a lot of computer power. So the biggest computer powers in the supercomputers are all in the first world. America, China, 
the UK have supercomputers. So you need these two factors together, and that's where all of this technology is. But there's a very important bit. Once it's developed, it can be used anywhere in the world through cloud technology. Therefore, developing countries can benefit from the work that other people are doing. So let's go back to nephrology, because this is human versus uh, artificial nephrology. Biopsy, reading biopsies is a problem in the third world countries or in developing countries, not available everywhere. I have an issue in our own center, we don't get them. Here, in this particular study, associated pathology so looking at fibrosis. So you then match up fibrosis score on a biopsy with a human, i.e. a pathologist, versus a computer. Who does better, you think? Obviously, in this talk, you're going to see the computer do better. But the computer does one thing more than the pathologist. I remember when we used to do biopsies, and they said, you cannot functionally predict the outcome from a biopsy. You can look at the histology. You can look at the outcomes if there's fibrosis, but trying to predict the GFR. So not without the creatinine, but predict the GFR from the biopsy can't be done. Well, here it's done. This model here looks at not one biopsy, millions of biopsies. You know human has the power to do that, but the computer can look at millions of biopsies, and through the artificial neural network and training, so we train the computer, it predicts the GFR status. So they doesn't know the creatinine there. It predicts the proteinuria. It predicts actually survival. And it also predicts the creatinine itself, high or low. So at this moment, it's very granular. It's not going to be that mix per deciliter. But that will come as we develop this uh, system more. So a pathologist can't do that. And then if you put it up against a pathologist, the outcomes are just as good. So here's a receiver, a receiver operating curve where you've got false positives and uh, true positives as well, looking at the computer model, which is in sort of black, and the pathologist, which is in the yellow. The computer model on the ROC curves outperforms the individual. You do not need a pathologist, dare I say it, okay? But you can do this remotely. This is cloud technology. You can do it in the village somewhere if you wanted to. So digital pathology lags. The only thing it does lag at the moment behind radiology. Radiology is far ahead in artificial intelligence. Computers are reading radiology all the time, much better uh, than the human itself. So there's lots of models out there. These are just a few papers in our particular field. So predicting models of blood pressure and fluid volume and dialysate dosage. At the moment, is very crudely done, but there's artificial intelligence methods to do that. Intelligence methods to look at future personalized therapy. Why do we have standard three hours, you know, four hours three times a week or twice a week or three hours? That's made up from our history of learning. But what about individualized care based on every case that's ever had happened before? No person can remember all that, but a computer has the power to remember every case as long as that data is in there. And then blood pressure assessment, different uh, pulse pressures and all those kind of things, the proof of concepts of all of these now exist in the present papers that I've shown you there. And then in the real world, these are lots of uh, studies looking at ADPKD, kidney transplant, hemodialysis, and uh, so on and so forth, and even AKI. AKI, it's not new. We used to call it acute renal failure. We change the nomenclature and then kid ourselves that this is a new disease. It's an old disease, but what the problem is, we're still using old biomarker serum creatinine. Here, a lot of these studies are not using that biomarker. So in the AKI study, it's predicting the outcome based on all the AKI that ever occurred in your institute. And nobody can look at that on their own. So all of these have a lot of uh, computer power associated. So let's move into the real world. This is where advanced days the AKI, AI already exists. And probably the pathology is not there yet. So this is an MRI scan, somebody with Alzheimer's disease. But the radiologist versus the AI. The AI predicted six years in advance that this gentleman would get Alzheimer's disease. But that wasn't predicted by the radiologist. So it's giving you six, weeks, six years notice in advance when you've done that scan. And similar with many other things. We've all got a little bit of arthritis. But when he's asymptomatic is what's what you want to know. When he's symptomatic, it's too late with the arthritis. So again here, another study. These are lots of MRI scans. No human can look at so many. But the computer can predict. Looking three years before symptoms start, it predicts in this case 86% accuracy that will get osteoarthritis. So three years gives you enough time to lose weight. So you don't you get your osteoarthritis. So it's important that in the, many of these conditions are preemptive as well. Moving to nephrology. You're out in the sticks. You do an ultrasound. Here, the report is coming as you do the scan. So here's just a case, straightforward MRI scan. It's obvious hydronephrosis. The computer then predicts the hydronephrosis as the scan is done. So the report is so real time, is generated as the scan is done. And that goes directly to your out for it, maybe your phone or maybe some sort of a healthcare system. And similar here, 
This is another study, automation of kidney function prediction on classic patient through ultrasound. So you're doing the ultrasound, and as the images come out, the computer compares them to every image that has been inputted ever before and predicts their GFR. It's not measured, but it predicts it from everything else. So those are the output images, and it does that. So that gives you real-time data at the same time. So two clinical scenarios for us. A clinical apical approach to continuous prediction of future acute kidney injury. So we talked about acute kidney injury before. KDIGO, AKI, the critical thing is urine output and serum creatinine. What if you don't have those values? Or where do you wait for those values to go up? So anybody can predict that. As soon as the AKI occurs, as soon as you see the serum creatinine goes up, but that's based on you taking the blood test. If you don't take the blood test, you will not know the AKI exists. So in this system here, in this particular model, this is serum creatinine over time. This is the risk of getting AKI based on all the parameters that are put into the computer system, so blood pressure, the cases, and so forth. And the risk of AKI goes up 48 hours before the serum creatinine does. So you are ahead of the game by 48. So the computer will predict 48 hours before you measure your serum creatinine has gone up or the urine output has dropped, that a risk threshold is reached, and therefore this is a case of AKI. Wouldn't that be great that you could preempt something, i.e. stop the ACE inhibitor or rehydrate the patient? Most of us are down here clinically, we wait for the creatinine to go up, then we do something about the risk. Too late. There's no new kids on the block for AKI. It's all about prevention. So why can't we do the prevention 48 hours before the AKI occurs? And that's similar for looking at predictions of serum creatinine, also looking at predictions of potassium as well, and also looking at uh, predictions of nitrogen, i.e. urea. All of those are predicted in advance of them going up. Here's another state. So a lot of you use SOFA scores, or you may be familiar with pre-optimization scores. So here is somebody coming in for improved predictive model for acute kidney injury and using this thing called IDEA. IDEA is interoperative data embedded analytics. It means a lot, but what it actually means is you do, somebody's coming in for a surgery, you do assessment to see how risky that surgery is. You then tell post-operative in ITU, they were very risky, it was a high risk case. But what you needed need to know is what happened intraoperatively during the uh, procedure. Did they have a hypotension? Did they lose blood? Was there any cardiac situation going on? So this model, what it does, it takes a pre-score and adds in the scores which are interoperatively, i.e. it adds in data that you collect, such as blood pressure, such as saturation, such as heart rate, during the operation, adds it to this score, and then gives you a better score afterwards. So the risk is continually assessed and continuously changing. So the final risk you get here is real time. It's not based on the thing that you did before the surgery, it's based on everything before and including the surgery. So that's important to know. And here's that model again. So SOFA score, this is risk again. So this is looking at the SOFA score going up, and this is the predicted mortality. Somebody here, this gentleman deceased, but the model predicted that they would decease at least 36 hours before. The score had gone up, and this prediction was 36 hours before the actual event, which was here. And it picked up on common things like measurable heart rate, mean arterial pressure, SpO2, temperature, and there were little variations, and then he had a cardiac arrest here and disease. The system was saying, and these are the event, clinical events that were happening hours before death, it was telling you here at 36 hours that this gentleman at zero will be dead. So what would, could you have done differently in hindsight that you knew that information? That's very important to us. And it's occurring, if you like it or not. So in the UK health-based system, hospitals using it. So artificial intelligence is used for people's retinal examinations. And it's shown that the retinal examinations done by artificial intelligence systems are better than an optometrist or ophthalmologist. It reached into nature medicine. So Google worked with DeepMind, which is a Google company, moved with the National Eye Hospital in the UK, which is Moorfields, and it was presented in Nature that if you ask an artificial intelligence system, it can predict by looking at your retina, by just looking at your retina, your age, your smoking habit, obviously if you're diabetic, your blood pressure, and your gender. It doesn't know any of that, but it compares your retina to the millions of retinas in its data banks. The human only compares to the one that I just saw two minutes earlier of their experience. You, and nobody can have, so 30 years of experience, but that's probably got 3 million years of experience when it's checking. So this is what most of the systems are based on. So the government in the UK has decided that this is the way forward and is going to build five new artificial intelligence centers in the UK. 
And guess where they're going to be? Where the major computers are, which are universities. So universities are getting huge grants and they want to collect data. And we are mining data through the NHS because we're electronic. And once that becomes available, the computer systems in the universities, and these are grants up to you know, 50 million per center. So everybody u university wants these. And then when they become available, they'll be you know, used throughout the world because it's cloud technology. You will use it from your iPhone, probably. This is another example of a hospital. We in the NHS have a primary care and secondary care system. Let us come into the secondary care. The letters are not triaged by a human, but by a computer. The computer then decides which department the letter should go to, and then automatically a, an appointment is sent. It removes the secretary, so the efficiency is there. But there's a risk to that. And DeepMind did get into trouble. So Google worked with, uh, this is Royal Free Hospital, and in this particular case, Musgrove and Royal Free Hospital, they got into trouble because we had a lot of data, but the patients don't even know that data had been extracted, been sold to Google for them to use. And therefore, the data manager and the security and the governance people did tell Google off. And there was a controversy, and that eventually was sorted out. So this is happening all the time. But not just in the UK. It's happening around all major centers in the world. So this is Mount Sinai in New York, global kidney health problems. And they also announced a partnership with AI Healthcare. Renolex is another AI company. Guess where that's from? And one of the major companies, such as Google. So it's a subsidiary. Right. So you can see how it's all building up. And for those who don't believe this is not going to happen, it's happening. So this is just looking at computer power. So Moore's law states that uh, computer power doubles every two years as the price of computers half. We are, are now here 2010, 2020. The computer power of the supercomputer is more than the computer brain of a mouse. We expect by 20, before 2030, the computer power of a supercomputer will be more than that of a human. And by 2045, hopefully when I'm retired, we'll have computers which are more, have more brain power than the whole of mankind put together. So it is happening, irrespective. It's a threat to our jobs as we believe it. We are here, we are in very, uh, today we're in artificial intelligence, we're in narrow base, so things that are, you do repetitively can be repeated by a computer. We'll move into generalized, uh, artificial intelligence in 2040, and we don't know when supercomputers appear. So I'm not going to scare you about that. So what do you do? need to do different? If you think your job is at risk, you need to do the kind of things that computers cannot do. If you do mundane, regular jobs, task-orientated, then that can be definitely done better by a computer than you, no doubt. But do jobs that are not. So we've got here creative jobs. Those are creative and do not require artificial intelligence. So columnists, scientists, artists, you not, can't predict an artist's brain because they think left of center all the time. Competitive jobs, repetitive jobs, dishwashers and truck drivers. And it says here hematologists, by the way. They're very repetitive, apparently, because they just look at screen. Radiologists definitely are under threat because they look at a lot of imaging. The computer can look at the imaging better than the human. And then CEOs as well. So you want to move yourself into jobs where there's a lot of compassion and there's very little optimization. So here, a lot of compassion, CEOs, columnists maybe as well, but these repetitive jobs are like security guard, telesales are going to be at risk because they're repetitive, can be easily done. So this is how we see the future. You want to be in this where you've got a lot of human factors which the computer cannot do. You've got anything that the human, uh, computer can do very easily, your job's at risk. There's some jobs which are a mixture of both and I think that's where we need to be. We need to be symbiotic with the computer, not in competition with the computer. And there's other jobs that will obviously disappear. So in preference, predicting the future, big data machine learning and clinical medicine. Clinical medicine requires doctors, we hold that, to handle enormous amounts of data. But we now have computer systems that can do that. But our patients are getting more complex. How complex? You know, my patients have about five to six comorbidities, not just the one. My patients are much older. They're about 80 to six, uh, 60 to 80 years old. Machine learning can help you you know, get all that information together to better understand the patient. So patients are getting complex. Medicines has progressed. We started off medicine being religious healers, then in European medicine came in, which is more of an art form. We are now in medical AI, which is really evidence-based, and it connects medicine to hard science. You always go to look for the hard science, and you can't remember it all. You cannot stay on top of everything all the time. This privacy and data sharing and physician-patient relations will be affected by computer systems in the future. 
and there's medical training. We need to think how we're going to train our next lot of doctors because they may not need to know how to drive or write because the computer will do that, but they need to think differently. So look at it from a different perspective. We should think about AI as augmented intelligence and AI and human intelligence complement each other, making up for each other's shortcomings. We have shortcomings, computers have shortcomings. Together they can perform the tasks task much better than individually. Uh, benefits and risk of artificial intelligence, again, this is Max Tegmark, he's a future leader of artificial intelligence, and again, he's saying the same thing, we should work symbiotically. So to wrap up, we are moving, if you believe in evolution, from, which is quite nice here, we've got little robots doing it, but we need to influence this, because obviously the nightmare scenario is there, where we will not, no longer be the superior species on this planet. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we're going to have questions towards the end of the session. Uh, this was a very exciting time ahead, I think, for artificial intelligence. CKD and renal patients have a lot of data that we generate. And I think we will be able to help our patients lead better lives. And I think life will become probably easier for nephrologists if a lot of it is automated. I think already anemia management mm -hmm. and phosphorus yeah, management yeah. is being automated. While at the same time, I think, keeping the privacy of our patients mm. intact. I invite the... It's my pleasure to invite the next speaker, uh, Professor Ming Hui Zhao. We had uh, an, a really wonderful session with him earlier. Professor Zhao is a prolific researcher. He gave an elegant talk, which was a combination of bench to bedside. And Today, I think he's going to tell us about some data in China. He is a chief of renal division at Peking University Hosp First Hospital, chair of ISN North and East Asia Regional Board, as well as the vice president of the Chinese Society of Internal Medicine, as well as of the Chinese Society of Nephrology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor. Again, I would appreciate the invitation. Uh, Next uh, 25 minutes, I want to show you the, another uh, example to use big data, uh, China uh, kidney disease network. Uh, four parts. The first is the, the background uh, of the CKD in China. Uh, I want to show you a few uh, papers which is in, involved. The first one is the, the Lancet study to indicate China and uh, uh, the dialysis uh, prevalence is less than 500 per million. And uh, also, if you look at these figures, and in the future, in the year of 2030, two million of patients on dialysis will be in Asia, and uh, 1.5 million will come from China. So that is uh, the, the situation we are facing. The third paper I want to show you that is an epidemiological study of AKR in Chinese uh, hospitalized patients. Uh, I just want to show you one thing. If you, that, that is the CKD, I'm sorry, not AKR, the CKD. We have only 10% awareness. And if you look at the cause of the CKD in China, the number one is uh, glomerular nephritis. The number two is diabetic. Uh, kidney disease, and uh, the third is hypertension, the fourth chronic pyelonephritis, and uh, the fifth is uh, very special for Chinese because we take a lot of herbal medicine, we have drug-induced nephropathy. Another problem is uh, the AKI also could progress to CKD. That is uh, the third epidemiology study from our division. We also have a national uh, survey to show you the AKI. Actually, every year we have three million patients uh, will be AKI, which is uh, uh, indicate uh, hospitalized patients. But if you look at, if you using the RCD-10 code to diagnose, uh, to have a diagnosis, we only have 16.7 of the patients was finally uh, right have the diagnosis of AKR. That means over 80% of our, our patients, actually, they don't know they have AKR during the uh, hospitalization. 
So we believe that is the reason, one of the reason to, to, to let the AKR patient finally progress to CKD. And the first, the, the fourth I want to talk about is the drug induced CKD. Uh, one medicine I want to mention is the herbal medicine containing uh, erythrocholic acid, which is cause uh, uh, CKD with unknown region. Now it's reported generally in our population is 1.5 of the, the population has already received this kind of herbal medicine. That is regular use. The second is the NSAID. About 3.6% of our patients, of our general population will report they have used this medicine. That, that two medicines definitely will cause CKD and uh, especially chronic uh, tubular interstitial nephritis. The second part I want to tell you four uh, challenge of uh, kidney care in China. The first one, we do not have a national, uh, uh, national surveillance system. We don't know what happened in general, what kind of the trend of the disease. So it's very difficult for the policy maker to make some decision because they do not have the right data. The second is, uh, I'm sorry for the, the format is changing. And the second is uh, we have a larger patients of CKD. If uh, according to a survey, national survey, we have uh, 120 million CKD in our country. However, we only have around 10,000 registered nephrologists. It's, and it's impossible to take care of so many patients. That is uh, one problem. The, the other one is we do not have a well-established referral system. That means the nephrologist, sometimes you see a lot of patients. Sometimes you don't know who is going to come, come to the, your door. And uh, especially the, after the transportation becomes easier, some patients from other provinces just came to Beijing, then they just want to see you. Sometimes you don't know who is going to come. So, so that's uh, a big waste for all the healthcare. The third I want to mention is a kind of uh, the medical migration. Uh, I use this word because in, other, in some province, a third of our CKD patients were taken care of by, by the doctor in other province. For example, Gansu province in, in the West China, the, a third of their patients moved to Beijing or Shanghai. If you look at in Beijing, in Beijing, once fourth of the patient came from other province. So especially in our hospital, we have hospitalized patients. 60% of our patients came from other province. So that is a, a big problem because we do not have very efficient uh, referral system. So the patient could move uh, around everywhere. The, the fourth I have mentioned is about awareness. If you, I'm sorry for the small uh, characters. I just want to show you if the patient with CKD, if they have protein urea, relatively easier for the patient to know, to show their doctor, I have uh, renal disease. However, if, if, if the patient have no uh, protein urea, non-albumin urea, then some patient even has uh, EGFR less than 30. The patient still don't know. So that is the problem. We have a lot of CKD. They don't know they have disease. That is the, the overall awareness for all the CKD is only 10%. 90% of the CKD don't know they have CKD. That is a, a big problem. The third part I want to talk in why we want to do the CK nets. That is uh, to, to build up a, uh, a network. That is, uh, I want to, want to show you that is a plan in our division. We have uh, a lot of uh, uh, network uh, hospitals in other provinces. Now, we have uh, several five-year plan. The first, I think, the, the 11th five-year plan, we do prevalence 
survey, national survey, because we got investment from the government grants. The sec the 12, five years, we do risk factors for CKD. That is, we need to build up our, our CKD cohorts. But the CKD cohorts, I have, we have 3,000 patients, which is follow up for five years. We invest 10 million Chinese yuan. It still couldn't make it. So that means the CKD cohorts will be very uh, costly. So we have to think in, but how could you, if you don't need such a uh, investment, then you could go the result. That is a, the fifth, uh, 13th five years plan. We want to do uh, some big data analysis. We want to attract a lot of different data from the country. Then they could find something from the, uh, the sausage like the different data put together. And, uh, and also, we have a 60 larger renal center to support us. Uh, at the year of uh, 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 2014, my mentor, Professor Haiyan Wang, passed away. She used to mention she really hoped we could establish CKNS. Then we could do that. Since the next year, we establish this CKNS. We're talking to the administration, hope they could let us access to the national data system. And also we build up a center for data science in Peking University. And also you Peking University uh, uh, Public Health Center. And finally, we have the a chance to establish a National Institute of Health Data Science in Peking University. That will make this institute a kind of national key laboratory. In that case, we will receive stable investment to do uh, big science uh, studies. We also have a, a scientific committee, either from international or domestic. We also have some uh, technic, technic support from uh, Harvard, from US RDS. But the US RDS is an example for us. We need to learn from them. And also some from uh, the, the United States, they give us a lot of uh, suggestions. The, the aim of the CKNES, we have three aims. One is to provide data-based evidence for healthcare policy. The second, to strengthen academic research. The third, we want to promote effective kidney management. We're using the, the following dates, uh, data, the national admi administrative data, and the public health platform, and the national claim data. That means if you want, if you spend a single penny of money from China government, we will know you. Because you have a, a single ID, then we know where you are dialysis, then we can, we, can, we can calculate how many patients we have. And also regional medical platform, and the epidemiology data, and the real world medical uh, uh, data. Then we put together, then we know a lot of things. That is our first version of the CKNET, which is published in C uh, AJKD in parallel with US RDS. After US RDS published, they, they published the, the China uh, uh, kidney network because they believe uh, due to the big population of China, we have uh, a rapid emerging economy. After 30 years, and the and our disease spectrum have a dramatic change. So that will be example. We want to know what happened in this population. So the first version mainly focus on CKD and the transplantation. Then I want to show you the, the new version of the CKD in KI, because the AJKD was sponsored by American uh, uh, Kidney Foundation. They, after they changed their editor-in-chief, they, they decided to uh, put this signal to KI, because KI is, is sponsored by the ISN, so it, it, it will be better. Then, six months ago, we have a two versions of one in Chinese, 
uh, in another one in KI to show our uh, second version of CKNET, which is investigate the year of 2015, what happened in China. This uh, version have uh, four national database. We have 12 months uh, teamwork. We involve 13 member of work group and uh, 50 member of the advisory committee. We use one million patient's data uh, of the kidney disease, which is involving CKD, AKI, uh, also dialysis, PD, and HD, and transplantation. That is a uh, show you some of the figures. One is the CKD. The percentage of CKD increasing uh, by the age. However, the male is always higher than female. In totally, uh, nearly 5% of the patient, inpatients are uh, CKD. The second, you see, uh, the last uh, epidemiology published in the Lancet is 12-12. Uh, 2012. After only three years, we will show the etiology of CKD has changed dramatically. That is the number one cause of the patient inpatient is DKD, then hypertension, then obstructive deep kidney disease, that is kidney stone. And also the force, the glomerular nephritis drop to force, for the number one drop to the force. So that is the disease spec spectrum is changing. And also important, I want to mention, in some province, that is an underdeveloped province, they have the highest DKD. That means sometimes they have some income, but they don't know how to live, have their life. They haven't changed their lifestyle. So they just eat, no exercise. Another two is for the kidney stones, for the southern China, we believe that is really related to the use of hard water. Uh, so those just indicate a lot of uh, difference between different uh, provinces. If you look at the CVD in CKD patients, it's 18% for the CKD hospitalized patients. If you have CKD uh, in the name of cost and the stay, length of the stay in the hospital will be increased, significantly increased. That means CKD increase your uh, money uh, spending. And uh, you also could look at the dialysis. For HD, that is for PD, that is for, for bigger hospital, tertiary, uh, tertiary hospital. PD is still in the bigger hospital. The HD has moved to the secondary hospital. We hope both of them will move to primary hospital and the secondary hospital. We don't want the big teaching hospital to do a lot of dialysis. And the, the teaching hospital and the, the academic hospital should do research, should treat very severe, very difficult patients. That is a, the, the possibility. And we're also using the national wide clean database to, add, to, to, to calculate the prevalence of HD and, uh, and the PD. That is the province prevalence. For HD, is 400 per million. For PD, is 40 per million. If you think of the Chinese population, 1.3 uh, billion, that means we have Five, four, five hundred, no, 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 not five hundred, five hundred thousand, yes. Five hundred hemodialysis and the five hundred, uh, um, fifty hundred PD. So put together, it's nearly, nearly six hundred uh, thousand patients on dialysis. And then they increase every year by over uh, 100 million. So that means in the year 20, 19, we should have 1 million dialysis patients. It's the number double of the number of uh, Americans. So that is not very good because they spend a lot of money. If you have look at the expenditure for HD, they spend 87,000 Chinese yuan a year. For PD, they only 30, 73, the PD is cheaper. However, for PD, if you are hospitalized, you spend more money than the HD. 
So that gives you a different uh, thinking about whether we should expand our PD population. If you remember, I have mentioned the CKD patients have 18% uh, have uh, CVD. If you're on dialysis, 45% will have CVD. That is a very severe situation. The third I want to show you is the, uh, the distribution of the transplantation list across China. Uh, finally, I want to show you a few slides. If you have the big data analysis, it's not only to establish the uh, data, the network, you also could increase your scientific research. That is uh, several examples. One example uh, which is published in New England Journal of Medicine to show from the year 2011, the Chinese uh, CKD patients is going to change. The number one cause, glomerular arthritis drop down, and uh, the, 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 the number two, DKD, become increasing, and that the gap became increased. The second I want to show you is about the uh, primary glomerular disease. If uh, that is the uh, renal biopsy determined, we have number one RGA necropsy for many, many years. But nowadays, another disease called membranous necropsy is increasing. You know that? That is due to the air pollution or other heavy metal pollution because the industry lies, then you have the consequence after a few years, the membranes will increase dramatically. That is also uh, parallel with the different province. We have a, a province called Hebei province, which is produced a third of the, the iron and the, and the steel from China. We have the most prevalent membranes necropsy. Even when they do it up, up seventy percent of the patients will have membranes. So that means that the air, that the environmental pollution will be very important for the disease spectrum change. I also show you in the morning about ANCA disease because I mainly focus on ANCA and autoimmune kidney disease. That is, uh, we have uh, uh, 10,000 ANCA disease which is distributed in northern China, older patients and uh, older patients over 60 years and also mainly uh, in the winter. And we also write uh, uh, our idea why we want to do the CKNETS, uh, which is published in the med medical journal, to show because in China we have, we have such a big population, anything change maybe will be lessened for other emerging countries. After they developed, they will, have, they will face the same situation. So in the future, we hope using, uh, to remember my mentor, Professor Haiyan Wang, we want to initiate, to, to establish a kidney, a Haiyan Kidney Initiative, which is uh, based on kidney disease, and big data, and uh, AI technology, and the blockchain technology, and also internet plus, and the uh, internet of things. We want to make it uh, more intensive. Finally, I'm sorry for the smaller uh, character and, and also the changing of the format. The CKNET actually provides you the solid database for the policy maker to make any changing of uh, health policy. And also that one will provide a platform for anyone who do academic research. You have enough data. If you want to have something to, to mining, you have a lot of things. Because you have such a big data, you, you, can, you, you can investigate something you wanted. And also we hope using this platform to train some researchers from different provinces to do a lot of things they want to know. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Uh, I think we will have questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much. I think this was a phenomenal effort. It will encourage us in Pakistan also to collect data, uh, especially I think that you were confronted with like four times the population that USRDS is uh, dealing with. And again, highlighting the importance of uh, consolidating data. I invite um, Dr. Saeed Ahmed again. I think he's going to talk about interventional nephrology again from west to east.
Are you going to talk about robots? Okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, this talk is uh, based really on a celebration of what PSN has done on this conference, which is unique almost to what I can see in the UK. So there's really nothing new here, but just to show that, that the bridges of collaboration need to be strong, and we show, uh, have a, a lot of collaboration going forward. So these are my uh, posts right now. I work in the South France Sunderland Hospital. I'm a clinical director there now. Uh, so data, I mentioned it in my first talk, as we mentioned just uh, in the previous speaker as well. These are the real units in the UK. Hopefully Pakistan will have a national registry as well and produce data like this. We've been doing this now for about 20 odd years. And this particular data set is uh, for the 52 real units that exist in the UK. And just for your information, we live somewhere over here. We're not living in London like everybody thinks. We are here. This is the northeast of the country. And those three units from Sunderland is in one of them. So uh, this is European data from the National Registry. This is where UK is regarding uh, international comparison of RRT incidents. So this 2015 data, we're about here. You've just heard from the Chinese data set. That's way off the scale over here. You know, so you need to know where, what you're comparing to. So China is over here, we are here. We're just over 100 per million population starting dialysis. So we're a small country of 65 million people and 100 per million start dialysis. We, but our systems are quite advanced in the sense they are tariff-based dialysis and we're incentivized to improve vascular access and that's what we're going to talk about. We are disincentivized to do tunnel dialysis catheters, more for the money but also for the morbidity. You are all familiar with the morbidity of tunnel dialysis catheters, which is uh, admission risk is higher, mortality is higher, venous occlusion, and we get paid, so we get paid to do dialysis by our providers less for tunnel dialysis catheter versus somebody on arteriovenous fistula or AVG on dialysis. The difference is, so this is in pounds, 113 versus 141. It works out two and a half thousand pounds per year difference. So it is an incentive, not only from the ethical value of good care, but also from the monetary value as well. And it costs a lot as well when somebody has problems with a tunnel dialysis catheter. So we are in incentivized to do that. The government think that is the right thing to do. However, more recently, we may think we need to revise this because this is actually guidance that's come out quite a while ago, uh, almost about eight years ago. So in my practice, we try to attain those uh, and achieve those. And we had a very complex way of looking after patients in multiple specialities, vascular, radiology, nephrology, and also cardiology. And this, I don't want you to look at it in a lot of detail, but it just shows one of my colleagues did this particular uh, graphic and showing that the pathway of care between getting a fistula done and then actually having a good outcome and people ending up on tunnel dialysis catheters and all the different people involved. The green is all that you want to look at. That's the nephrology involvement. At the beginning, a little bit in the middle. The rest is all here, which is vascular surgery and also radiology and patient time. And we looked at this paradigm almost four years ago and said we need to ch make a change because we cannot go on like this. We're not achieving the, the target so that we are being set to do so. Um, national data set drove the change as well. So this is, again, the three units where we work. So there's 52 units in the country, and these are the three units in the northeast. And we were down here showing that our prevalence rate for tunnel dialysis catheters was higher than expected. We're supposed to reach in an incidence population of 60% on fistula and uh, on a prevalent population of 85% on a uh, fistula. So we were not achieving that. Our incident population was 50% and our prevalence population was 65%. So we were below the national target. So, and so what do we do? Well, we need to do something different. You know, we're all very busy. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to do things, but we had to do something. So we did something. In 2016, I took a team, myself, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Clark, who's in the audience, we went to the States. We had a look. We didn't think they were doing the best, but we thought maybe doing something different. And these two guys we met who are doing dialysis access in an access center outside the hospital. So this is Tom Vesely and Steve Bander, one radiologist, one nephrologist. And that's their equipment, nothing special. This is only just a portable system in a clinic on top of orthopedic uh, sort of outpatients, but not in a hospital. That's all they had. We visited, and it's always good, and only when you connect with people, to visit in a team, you cannot make a change on your own. The most powerful driver in change in your department will be the nurse. And until you realize that, you will not be able to make change, because they have great ownership of the patient. They have close contact to the patient more than you. 
So we took our vascular access nurse. We took at that stage uh, Rory, who was my junior doctor at that time, my registrar, and myself. And we had a little, little look around. And we decided that we want to follow a different model. We wanted to offer a weekday consultant delivered care. So not registrar delivered, consultant delivered care. Same on next day assessment or any access issues. Improve and enlarge our ambulatory care setting so people are not admitted to the hospital. Develop a screening program. Early start PD, you will be very familiar with those kind of things. Acute PD and an increase in PD in heart failure, which is a, a common phenomenon in our patients as well. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we convinced our managers, because that's all, all is in the business case, to have fewer hospital admissions, fewer he missed hemodialysis sessions due to lack of access, reduce pressure on the in-center hemodialysis program, reduce the reliance on di tunnel dialysis catheters, fewer re uh, re redo arduvenous fistulas, and reduce the pressure. So we thought we could make a cost saving of 300,000 uh, pounds per year if we got the tariff right and we got the right patients into the right areas. So obviously the business people in our hospital bought, on, bought into that. It took me three years to get them convinced. It wasn't a short journey. The whole journey is about 10 years and this is a culmination of that. At the same time when we thought about going to the States, this came out. Very, a lot of you are familiar with NEFSAPS. This is a, a journal that was used for training and uh, there's some advanced training available. So we thought we'd tap into that. So we had a little visit. We learned a few little tricks. All of you do tunnel dialysis catheters, I'm pretty sure. But uh, do you do them the best way possible? And you learn probably from your registrar or your senior registrar, but are there really consultants who are teaching you, who are, are experts in that field? Well, there weren't many in the UK, so we went to the States. Little trick, you put a tunnel dialysis catheter in, a lot of people are obese, they may have a pacemaker in something. You want to make sure that the skin is actually retracted back, so therefore you get good access to the veins. That's one thing. Veins vary, you need to have good equipment. We used to do these blindly. We've moved into obviously using ultrasound. But what is the best ultrasound machine? We looked at all three of these machines. All three of these machines. And this is the old machine I bought many years ago. About ten, that's 10 years old. These are the new models. They were too expensive. Couldn't afford them. We went for this model instead, it was half the price. And I really kicked myself, I shouldn't have gone for it because, as you all know, they got even cheaper, which is they're like this now. This is $2,000. I paid about $20,000 for my machine, and the expensive machines were $40,000. So it's not about affordability, because I'm sure even in a developing country, $2,000 is much cheaper than many of the machines that you've got on your wards. So maybe we move to this technology. Then we learned how to do the tunnel dialysis catheter properly. We all thought we were doing them properly. We learned how to use fluoroscopy and learned a little bit of radiology with the Benson wire and the, the different French gauges that we use. And we learned the position is very important. So putting the position in the right position, the vein venotomy site that you make is important as well. And we've done that in some of the training we've done at the PSN uh, this week, which we'll show. And then de determine the correct length. Honest to God, I was doing them for 10 years until we learned this. I was now kicking myself that we should really be very accurate in where we place them. So we use techniques such as putting the wire down into the internal jugular vein, using, just measuring it by putting the wire down and making a, a little kink in the wire so we know where it is and using uh, thing, little techniques where you can uh, do fluoroscopy to bend the guide wire. So that's the position and we then size it once we've got the guide wire pulled back out. Then we know the exact catheter size. And why do you think it matters? Well, this particular paper, looking at where you place the catheter, SVC, the carina, right heart border, right mid zone, or the junction of the uh, ventricle here, and also the SVC. So it actually matters where you place it because if you place it in the ideal position, which is here, 245 day length of that catheter, that's how long it survives. Versus 12 days here, you see them in ICU, they put them on all sorts of positions. We all go a bit berserk when they put the temporary catheter here, or maybe here. So if you're gonna be meticulous, which many nephrologists are, which is a good thing, is happy that we are doing this. And honest, I wish I knew this when I was a resident. I didn't, and it wasn't taught to me that way either. And we had to go back to learn the basics again. And safety matters. Um, depends if you're available, but I'd, we do majority 95% of our catheters now under fluoroscopy. I know fluoroscopy is not available. We've done some cases in this country as well now. It's difficult. I'll tell you how we started. We started in cardiology labs out of hours. It's the passion that you have to get the extra hour that you can before they start the list or in the evening. And guess what? That was the same in the States 20 years ago, the same in the UK, and it'll be the same in this country. The, you know, the migration, the evolution is always the same, but try not to reinvent the wheel. 
So orientation of the tip of the catheter is important. So once you start doing fluoroscopy, you can then look at the tip and make sure that's orientated correct correctly as well. And then you can do left-sided catheters. Do you think many of you will do this blindly, left-sided, when this is what you're actually doing with a, a double lumen catheter? You're putting a huge trocar down here. You can imagine the risk of causing a mediastinal tear. It has happened. We've seen it happen. You wouldn't find me doing it. So even from a safety point of view, if you cannot find the resource, it is impelling uh, sort of evidence base to do that. Now, one thing we do do different, and we've done on this occasion in Sheikh Zayed Hospital only a couple of days ago, is talk about replacement catheters, which we did uh, on one case for fibrin sheath removal. And fibrin sheath develops within days, uh, from here, days to weeks. So, and the reason is plasma proteins, platelets, thrombus, all those kind of things all develop. So what to do? Well, you can replace the catheter, that's fine, but you put it back into the same sheath that you did before. And this is uh, some histology. This is the catheter lumen, and you can see around it the sheath, and this is one we've removed. You can see the sheath. So it develops very quickly. So those placing catheters, it's easy to replace it, but you, have, you can't replace it back in the same fibrin sheath that it's just been removed from, because you're actually not going to make the catheter live any longer than it did already. So what do we do? Well, we look at the catheter, we do some fluoroscopy images, and we start doing venography of these catheters as well. This is the pathology, develops in days, as you see from the lumen, and then migrates backwards towards the cuff itself. So now, when we replace the catheter, we pull the catheter back, and we do what we call a pullback angio. So we put some contrast dye down, and you can see here, there is a sheath there, because it hasn't gone into the larger IVC. We would then go on to do a plasty of that. Yes, are we trained to do this? We have training to do this. Are we radiologists? No, we're not. Is it safe? Safe as long as you know the risks that are involved. This is a large vessel. These are large balloons up to 10 millimeter wide. And therefore, using the pressures that we use, it's pretty safe to do so. Yes, it's in the mediastinum. You need to know what you're doing and select your patients very carefully. But if you do that and then replace the catheter, so here, you can then say the flow is much better in the more of the IVC than before. So it's a simple thing to do. And it is easily done as well. So here we go. The catheter, uh, if you have no sheath, it's 849 days. You put it back in with a sheath and no uh, plasty, this 373 days. And you can see the difference between the two in this particular paper. So it's worth removing the sheath if you can. Tunnel to cuff venous catheter should all be placed in the fluoroscopy. So this is national guidance in the UK but due to the risks that are involved. We have had fatalities as a result of this. If you've ever, and this is obviously recognized nationally, so it's incumbent on every hospital to provide that. Here's a case we did, and we managed to put a guide wire down here, but we put a guide wire here, and we didn't know where we were, and we learned from that. This has gone into the zygous vein. So you need to know your anatomy. As juniors, you need to be taught that actually this is a straightforward IVC, but behind it runs the zygous vein. And that sometimes is patent, and sometimes you get your wire down there, and if you're doing them blindly, you won't know you've done that. You may place the whole lumen of the catheter, not in this vein, but in this vein here. And that could be quite large, large as the IVC be due to uh, central venous occlusion. Okay? So it's easily done. And that's the anatomy. This is where you want to be, but your wire can come down the juggler and then go sometimes flip back and go down. And it looks very similar on the chest x-ray, but it'll be a deviation to the midline. And that is worth knowing. And it's a lesson we learned as well. And here's the case. You've got complete occlusion here of the I, uh, IVC. Occlusion there, and the zygos is quite large. You can see if you put a wire down here, sometimes it'll go straight around. So if you remove that occlusion with angioplasty as we've done here, then you open the uh, IVC up and the azygous is not as patent as before. And that's worth doing. So here we have replaced the catheter back in and we removed the occlusion. So central occlusion is common. You are using a lot of dialysis catheters and it's up to 41% of experience, uh, at least some sort of thrombosis with central occlusion leading to edema. And this is the risk. Those who are putting subclavians are causing a 40% risk of subclavian stenosis, 20% on the right side, 40% on the left, and 60% if you use a subclavian on the left. So it's right is the best to go, and then obviously we'll switch to the left. But subclavians are still done, and this is the risk you're putting your patients through of increasing thrombosis. And these are the kind of diagnosis, your nightmare situation of complete occlusion that you can get to if you don't uh, work out where the occlusion is. So there is a total risk of that happening. The other thing we do is not all these dialysis catheters. We have techniques of peritoneal dialysis, and we've talked about that a little bit. And here's the different methods we do. We do a medical PD catheter, and we do not have an externalized catheter. We have a buried catheter to allow you to put them in preemptively 
in advance of needing dialysis because you never know when you need it because it's very difficult to predict the decline of GFR in these patients. And that's a technique we've developed as well. So coming to a conclusion, I'm moving where interventional nephrology is the patient advocate. You're the nephrologist and you know your patients pretty well, but you need to bring a whole team of people with you. And with that, we managed to do this. So Dr. Clark, who was in my department, went back after 2016 to 2017 and retrained in the lab of Steve Bander and Tom Vesely. I had spent time there, and then he came back and taught us all. So here's wonderful, the registrar teaching the consultant. That never happens usually, but here it happened, and we are happy for that. And then we changed the pathway, and now there's lots of green in our pathway where we're centrally involved in the patient's care. And yes, there is some vascular team, but they're all in the theaters doing the, uh, doing the fistulas ourselves. And we have more control over the system of what's going on. And then we launched that from 2016. I can't do any of this on my own. This is where the collaboration comes. Started with me, then Dr. Clark, we had our vascular nurse, and now two more colleagues. Me and Dr. Clark are only here because my colleagues are doing all the work back home. You cannot leave your unit without support. I need to bring everybody along so they can also learn. This is the program we want to develop. So in the UK, we do not have interventional nephrology as a program, but this is what we are pushing through the curriculum. So if you're a nephrology trainee in the UK, you can become a consultant as long as you can put a temporary vascular catheter in. Not even renal biopsy, native transplant is mandated. It's optional, and all of this is optional. So where we are in Sunderland, we have developed a system that between us all, we do all of this. We offer this as to our patients, as patient level care. We hope that people are interested to do at least stage two of training, which is some PD catheter insertion, tunnel dialysis catheters, and ultrasound training as well. And as we launch those systems, many of you junior doctors need to follow us through that to provide the support for you and for us. So this is our Twitter feed for simulation training in vascular access and dialysis issues. And we train our nurses in simulation training in the acute situation. And this is our junior doctor training that we do, similar to the PSN workshop we did yesterday. Much smaller scale, but we use that to learn from here and teach here the other day. We did a lot of uh, practicing before we came here. But we all make mistakes. Here's a mistake of mine I'm happy to share. The patient survived. You'll notice here there's a cath uh, chest x-ray. There's a catheter, but there's no external bit, and the catheter has completely slipped into the IVC, uh, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava in the heart. So you are stuck. This is catheter removal gone wrong. And this is one of my cases I did when I was junior, and I managed to lose a catheter. So we had to have the radiologist to snare the catheter and remove it from the femoral vein. So you do need the help at times, but you need to know what is safe. On the other side, collaboration. This is why we're here today. These are the journey from the West. These are some of the characters you will recognize. Prof. Aris Arif Asif, who has visited our unit. This is my vascular surgeon. This is myself. We got him inviting to give a talk to our radiologist. The radiologist learned from the nephrologist, the kind of things we're doing. We then launched our team only. And here you'll see one of your local characters, Haroon, who's working in my department as a collaboration via PSN and Sheikh Zayed, who's working here. And then turn the whole story back. We came to Sheikh Zayed only two days ago, and we did some cases here. You did it on the resources that are available to you. Your resources are no more than what we have back home in UK. They're no more, but we managed to deliver it because we have great passion and belief in what we want to do. And yesterday, we did a very successful PSN, six stations. This has never been done in the UK. This will be now taken the other way, from the east to the west. We will learn from you. We got some of the world's experts in Professor Maria Richards from ISN, your local experts here who are interventional nephrologists from Saudi Arabia, from the UK as well. This has never happened and it should be celebrated. And I think this is publishable. And we will, I have the feedback from this, we will publish it either locally or internationally. And it has to be celebrated because we want to use it in the UK. Remember, the last question. Nephrology started with access. It was by nephrologists, not surgeons or radiologists. As you remember, Brescia, first vascular fistula was done by here, Brescia, asking a surgeon to do a radiocephalic fistula. First arteriogram was also done by a nephrologist. So when you have this kickback from radiology on surgical, just remind them what the history is, where we came from. As the Chinese know, you need to say, you need to know where you come from so that the journey can occur to where you're going to. So thank you very much. A very enlightening talk by Dr. Saeed Ahmed on intervention.
Vascular access is always an Achilles heel for the patients on human dialysis and of course a big fear for all the nephrologists. And involvement of nephrologists in intervention would definitely improve the outcome because we can feel that pain which human dialysis patient or uh, goes through. And we are always worried about that. In Pakistan, we have definitely a lot of room for this and this is a develop, developing field and we definitely need some people in Pakistan in this field. I now think it's a collaborative. We need your help as much as you need ours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions? You can ask questions from uh, first lecture or the, this lecture as well. <laughs> Somebody's not there. Can turn it off. Then any bantha. Uh, yes. My name is uh, Daniel Hassan. I'm from Shifar International. I have a question I think where we struggle uh, a lot is uh, with the vascular uh, access nurse. Yes. So, uh, I mean, we have, we have issues where we can pick up the problems with fistulas as our nursing staff is not trained and we don't have dedicated vascular access nurses in our units. Do you, do you have curriculum or do you, do you are you establishing curriculum as well where besides the physician there is training curriculum for the nurses as well? I'm really struggling to hear you. The question is uh, training of vascular access nurses? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the history of my unit is 30 years old. We used to have nurses from Sudan and Zimbabwe come to our unit many years ago. We lost that funding but we need to bring it back again and irrespective of where they are in the world, they need to come for training. We learn from the nurses here, and they learn from when they come over. We have exchange programs already for transplant, and I, sh I think we should have exchange programs for this as well. No, but do you have developed any curriculum for these vascular nurses? Say that again? Any curriculum for these vascular nurses? Encouragement. Right. Yeah, so this already, we in the UK are trying to do a, va a vascular access nurse training in a systematic way. There's a lot of variation in the country as well. But we've started a national program called MAGIC, which is making sure that each vascular access nurse knows how to do buttonhole, knows area puncture, stays away, for, you know, also knows about rope laddering, and they score the fistula. This is what allows us to give national data sets for each unit to know what kind of fistula types they got, how easy it is to put the needle in, and then we will train new nurses. They do easy fistulas first and then more complex fistulas later. But the training program is obviously lecture-based, but e-portfolio learning as well, so electronic-based, and then real-time. As you saw uh, Professor Maria Richards, we do a lot of simulation training. Simulation is pretty big in the UK right now, where we train people on mannequins to show how they can needle. So uh, my question is uh, regarding your AI and the prescription for automated peritoneal dialysis uh, therapies. My experience in US was that most of the doctors just copy paste one prescription to another or they use an app. There was no artificial intelligence leave, uh, in, uh, prescription generator available. Do you have thought about it or you need to work on this? I, I learned from my seniors, it was always three hours, two kilograms off, it was, and then you send it to your juniors. I tell you where we came from. It was a verbal instruction for a treatment which is more dangerous than many tablets you give to people. You know, the hypotension, the arrhythmias, the cardiac arrest that you can cause. But it's basically a verbal instruction. It's not recorded, so then something goes wrong, you can deny you said it. And the nurse has nothing to stand on. So the nurses said, no longer we're taking verbal instructions from the doctor, you need to write it down. So we moved, we started writing it down. It took, and guess what the biggest resistance to writing it down was? From the doctors. We don't want to write it down, we just tell you, just dialyze them take three hours, two off, no pump speed, no amount of heparin, it was never recorded. We have now moved to accurate recording. It is electronically recorded, so I can sit right here now with remote access and you know, dial in and then tell them which, uh, how to dialyze the patient. That is recorded, it's a legal document, something goes wrong, this is the prescription, this is the administration record. And it's a great resource for education. So the juniors then learn how to prescribe dialysis properly. Even in, uh, on call, we prescribe dialysis remotely. We have remote access. I, I've done prescriptions of dialysis halfway around the world. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm prescribing for the UK you know, in an emergency situation. A lot of people, there's a resistance, but actually it, once that resistance is gone, there's a lot of learning that can occur from it, both for the nurses and for the junior doctors, and maybe for seniors as well. Are you using any... 
only if there is a, a neckline related sepsis. So when we insert the neckline, there's no regular antibiotics given. The aseptic technique in our hands will produce very low amount of infection. If it's a difficult procedure and there's a lot of blood loss at the time of insertion, we will use prophylactic antibiotics. If we have subsequent neckline sort of infection, like CIBSI infection, yes, we have uh, protocols for that as well. Thank you, Dr. Said, and for such a nice and enlightening lectures and lectures, and then you conducted that workshop and also at your help at Sheikh Zayed Hospital. And we like you to come again and again to us and teach us on these things. Thank you. Okay. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Moving ahead with the next speaker, managing advanced kidney disease by a multidisciplinary approach uh, by Dr. Wasim Ahmed, who is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and a fellow of the American College of uh, Physicians as well. And he is a consultant nephrologist at Mafrik Hospital, UAE. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Vakar, uh, Dr. Ahad, and the, all the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about this um, important topic. Um, I'm actually um, listening to Saeed's talk has made me a little bit worried and also a bit happy. Um, worried because what I'm going to talk about might be done by computers, uh, so might not need me, um, but happy that it might not happen until I retire, so maybe another few years. So um, thank you, Saeed. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, um, epidemiology and a little bit of magnitude. I'm sure we've heard this before as well, but just to elaborate a little bit more about CKD. Um, what happens to patients who have advanced kidney disease and what issues we face in a standard outpatient clinic uh, when we manage patients who have progressive kidney disease and how can multidisciplinary approach um, help um, to manage these patients better? So um, CKD affects about 12% of the US population. Um, in 2018, this is recent data, about 700,000 pa 700, patients um, were receiving renal replacement therapy um, for end-stage renal disease. And it's estimated that in 2030, uh, the ES ESRD population might go up to more than 2 million. Um, and this is a very astonishing data, uh, just from, I took it from USRDS, just from 2018 that Medicare spends about $114 billion per year, and that's about 23% of Medicare spending just managing end-stage renal disease. So in Canada, same situation, they spend about $3 billion a year, and if patients have comorbidities, then it goes up to two, 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 two and a half times uh, that, uh, that number. And in developed countries, spend about 2 to 3% of their entire national health care budget on end-stage renal disease, and, and in developing countries, it's much lower. And one million people die from untreated and stage renal disease each year, so that's a huge number. So what's the situation in Pakistan? And I tried to get some data, and uh, it was, um, it, it, it's very variable, and it's perhaps not easy to get, as we, as we heard before. So the study which I found is that the annual incidence of the new cases of end stage renal disease is estimated to be more than 100 million per million population. Pakistan ranks eighth in the list of countries with high rates of renal disease and with 17 million patients with chronic kidney disease. The prevalence of diabetes varies in different studies, and as we heard yesterday from Professor Javed Akram, it can be as, as, as high as 15%, and uh, there are some studies reporting up to 22%, hypertension around 20%. The CKD varies from, um, in some studies, to as low as 5 and then as high as about 31%. And then we also heard from him yesterday that we may need more than a million hemodialysis stations in a few years' time if we continue at this rate, which is a huge number for a resource-limited developing country. So in Pakistan, the cost is about 4,000 um, rupees for a hemodialysis session. Um, and this is just hemodialysis session. This is excluding the drugs. So that means you're talking about about 50,000 rupees per patient per month, and that's if the patient is doing three times a week, and many patients do twice a week, as I understand, just because, especially if they are paying. Even if they are not paying, I think they still do sometimes twice a week, even in uh, places where it's free. 
The spending on health is just about 0.9% of the GDP. This is 2017. So we have less investment on prevention of end-stage renal disease and to delay the progression of chronic kidney disease. So what are the implications for CKD patients? As we know that these patients have clinical and economical burden, it's, it's dramatically increased as they develop end-stage renal disease. Um, I was working in Islamabad for a while, and it was a challenge. Many patients will not be able to afford dialysis at, even two times a week. So it's a huge economic burden. They have increased risk of hospitalization, cardiovascular complications, and myocardial infarction, stroke, and death. And they face a huge socioeconomic challenge. They have low health literacy. And we know that overall mortality is about 10 to 100 times higher as compared to the patients with, uh, or people with normal renal function. So cardiovascular mortality, as we know, it's high. And these are the slides. These are very old slides. Um, when I was in training, we were told the patient who is on, who's got end-stage renal disease in the 20s has the same mortality as a patient with 80-year-old with no comorbidities. So have the things changed? Not really. If you look at this slide, this is from recent um, US RDS data, and it suggests that the patient who has got ESRD or on dialysis has a more risk of dying as compared to somebody who has got cancer. So it's a huge cardiovascular mortality. So we, we are very familiar with, with the biochemical abnormalities which these patients have, the phosphates, the calcium, the anemia, and LVH, and all that. But I think one thing which we for, kind of lack of less concentrate on is the other physical and psychosocial aspects of CKD, which is a lot of patients have, there's a high risk of, or higher uh, depression in these patients, lifestyle changes, increased hospitalization, non, many patients are non-compliance, there's loss of earnings, um, sexual dysfunction, infertility, and we have increasing age. And they ha so we tend to, f to focus more on the biochemical and the um, other aspects, but perhaps sometimes overlook the other side of CKD management. So how do we manage? What is the standard care of patients who've got, let's say, a GFR of less than 30? So what, do we, what are we expected to do in a clinic? So if we go through the, this list, this is what we're supposed to do for a CKD patient who has got advanced kidney disease. We try to slow down the progression, correct metabolic acid-base abnormalities, cardiovascular risk, MBD, fluid balance, nutritional, dietary advice, vaccination, education, prepare them for dialysis. We try to deal with psychosocial problems, transplantation, and many, of, many a times we will see these patients who develop AKI in between. So can I have a show of hands as to how many of our colleagues can manage all this in one standard 10-minute outpatient consultation? Nobody. So I didn't see any hand. So what I'm saying is that the standard nephrology care is suboptimal. So we have short contact time. We have less time for education. Uh, it's well known that understanding any chronic disease is, is, it motivates compliance. So all these necessary um, interventions like dietitian, social worker, and access, we can't do it in a timely way, and, and all the other things. So this results in delays, delays in seeing the educators, delays in making decisions, delays in referral to vascular access, dietitians, and other aims of chronic kidney disease. And it's well known that 80 in some populations, 80% of the patients start dialysis with a, uh, with a catheter, and we know all the problems with catheters. We know that patients have low rates of home therapy selection in terms of PD and home hemodialysis or preemptive transplantation. So the end result of a standard outpatient clinic care is that it's complex, it's, it's fragmented. So does if the patient is being followed by a nephrologist, does that mean that they will always get a fistula? No, is the answer. So the studies have shown that even if the patient is under the care of a nephrologist, you may not end up having a fistula when you start dialysis. And this is a study from Karachi. I just took it, um, a local data. So this is a study from Ziauddin University Hospital, 120 patients, 80% started with a, with a catheter. And how, more than half of them were under the care of a nephrologist at, at a given time. So being under a nephrology care does not always mean that you're going to start hemodialysis with a fistula. And there are a number of reasons for that. So my message here is that standard nephrology care is suboptimal. So we need to look at other ways to do it. 
So the guidelines suggest that we should develop a multidisciplinary approach to manage these patients. So what does the multidisciplinary approach mean? So the multidisciplinary approach in CKD, the patient is the, is the center, and we have, we, so that we have education, treatment options, discussion, we give them dietary counseling, and, and dietary counseling is very important that there are so many things the patient will ask you, and perhaps a dietitian could also answer the question much more better than sometimes I do. I remember that somebody asked me a question, Dr. Sahib, I can eat tukh sakta hu. And I had no idea. I mean, kha sakte ho, nahi kha sakte ho. Later on, I had to find out. So a dietitian can also help you. And I was just showing some interesting thing. Uh, one of my previous colleagues from Islamabad, he was telling me, he was showing me a text yesterday that a patient messaged him at about 2.30 in the morning asking, Dr. Sahib, I anar ka juice pee liya hai. To ye theek hai? So uh, patients will ask your questions. I won't tell you what he answered, but these are the questions you will come across. So having a good dietitian, giving good education will definitely help the patients understand what they should and what they shouldn't do. Um, medication adherence and review by a pharmacist is, 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 is being shown extremely useful. A social worker will look into all the social issues, and especially in Pakistan, they can look into how they can get, for example, free dialysis or free medication and things. So this will help in dialysis access placement, the whole thing, a better transplant coordination, so, and, and advanced care planning. So this is the kind of model we should um, aim for. Now, it's, it's important to have a coordinator for this multidisciplinary. So one, somebody who can coordinate all this activity, and most, uh, in most cases, it could be a dialysis nurse who can, who can do that. So as, as, we, as the patient's renal function deteriorates, the, 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 the importance of multidisciplinary care becomes even more important. So what's the evidence behind what does multidisciplinary care works? Unfortunately, there are very few randomized control trials. So most of the data comes from cohort studies. And the important thing is, so what are we trying to achieve with this? We're trying to achieve, reduce the progression of kidney disease. And the studies have shown that, and, and especially a, a randomized control trial from Canada with um, a single education session and then followed up with phone calls to the patient, 18 months follow up showed that they, there was delay in starting renal replacement therapy by about three months and there are other studies showing up to six months. Now you can argue three months or six months, it's not much, but perhaps if you look into financial numbers and the number of patients starting dialysis every year, or every, uh, it could be a huge number. So same patient, for example, who is going to spend 50,000 for one month of dialysis, if you delay it by three to six months, he's gonna save 150,000 or maybe more by just delaying the start of dialysis. And this is just to show um, that multidisciplinary care can um, affect the progression. Similarly, a study from the UK has suggested that um, if patients had access to a nurse educator, a dietitian, and a, and a medication management, it, it reduces the, the progression of GFR. A Taiwanese study, uh, which is a prospective study um, from, uh, for two years, about 1,000 patients, and they looked at patients who received multidisciplinary care versus usual care, and they compared the incidence of um, progression to end-stage renal disease and also mortality. So they found that patients who received multidisciplinary care, there was a significant reduction in progression of kidney disease. They were using less uh, temporary dialysis catheter, and they were more likely to use peritoneal dialysis as a form of treatment, and there was mortality was significantly reduced in this group of patients. If we look at specifically the mortality data, again, this study from Canada shows a significant difference um, in, in mortality in patients who receive multidisciplinary care as compared to normal, uh, usual nephrology care. And these patients are much more educated um, as compared to ones who have not received the education. Uh, another study from uh, Canada and Italy, two centers, they compared again um, the multidisciplinary care versus normal care, and there was the, the, the conclusion was that the multidisciplinary care non-attendance was an independent predictor of death, and patients who received multidisciplinary care had much more hemoglobins, calcium, and albumin levels before starting a dialysis. And the patients who received uh, multidisciplinary care, not only they have better outcomes, even after starting renal replacement therapy, they live longer as compared to somebody who hasn't received multidisciplinary care. And similar data comes from uh, Fresenius 
uh, data that patients who have multidisciplinary care live longer even after uh, starting dialysis. Vascular access, we, we just heard, and if, you, if somebody starts um, dialysis where they're fistula, there is almost, and this is a bit, this is US data, but it, it's probably true for every part of the world, the cost is about $30,000, yes, as compared to somebody starting with a fistula. And we've heard, and I'm sure we've all seen the complications of, of temporary vascular access. I've seen endocarditis, I've seen discitis, and so it, it is a huge issue. Other important benefit of renal replacement that is, is of multidisciplinary care is that it helps to choose, help makes patients choose about whether they want to go on PD or, or hemodialysis. Many patients don't know much about PD, how it's done and what are the benefits as compared to hemodialysis. And the studies show that if you give them good education, the chances are that they may, may opt for PD. Now it's also known that if the patients start hemo first, the chances of them then selecting PD is much lower as compared to if they had starting PD from the beginning. And PD first also saves money in about $220,000 per patient per year if the PD is selected first. Preemptive transplant, we know that transplantation uh, is, uh, improves survival, and if it's done before dialysis, obviously it has got savings in terms of mortality and plus the cost. And in standard, Dallas, in a standard outpatient clinic, patients have a lot of questions about transplantation. Sometimes it's difficult. You need perhaps a few sessions to do it. So the, the, the multidisciplinary care education can, can do it much quicker and much faster. And the, the, the question which everybody will ask is, you are putting a lot of effort, you're putting a team together. Does it really make a difference? Is it cost effective? And to summarize, because of time, it does make a difference. Uh, studies have shown in terms of both randomized control trial and prospective studies from Taiwan and Canada that it is cost effective. It saves money uh, in terms of reduce infection, reduce hospitalization, um, and usage of fistulas and, and usage of PD. So because, I'll just try to share some personal data, personal program, uh, which we did. Um, I was working at, in Saudi Arabia at that time, and we had problems. Um, we, were, we had four nephrology clinics. We had no idea about how many CKD, four or five patients we had. Um, we had high numbers of crash landers, very low fistula rates, number of reasons for that. Our transplant, preemptive transplant was slow, and we were not able to vaccinate the patients. So we developed a multidisciplinary program. We, uh, we wanted to obviously achieve the objectives in terms of providing them with education, optimize care, reduce complications, inform choice about renal replacement therapy, and we wanted to make this whole coordinated effort. We had issues and we wanted to improve it. So we made a team. Uh, the team was comprising of a um, social worker, a pharmacist, dietitian, a renal nurse. We had a diabetic educator when we had a diabetic patient, and we had a psychologist, uh, a, um, a, psychi a psychiatry liaison nurse if we needed the patient. So we developed education materials. We, um, we created a CKD education book in Arabic, uh, a vaccination and a medication booklet, and we also created a, a, a video in Arabic to show to the patient. So we got very excited. We, uh, we got a, the team was really excited. They were really upbeat about it. And we thought to save time, we'll do it in a group. So we decided to do the, the education in a group session. Uh, we invited about 10 patients and their families uh, we got the, the tea and the coffee and the biscuits, uh, everything, uh, and guess what happened? Nobody came. So <laughs> we thought, what's happened here? <laughs> so we called everybody. Said, what happened? Why didn't you come? So people said they had different views. Somebody said that we prefer to discuss our personal issues perhaps one-to-one. -one. We don't want in a group. Uh, so that was a valid reason. Some people said we couldn't make it that time. So we changed our practice. So we then decided to do the education session based on patient and the family availability. So it became one-to-one, -one and then it, it took, took off. Uh, we uh, gave it uh, to the education to the all, all outpatients, patients referred from outpatients, but we also gave education to patients who, who crash landed and then did not have any education at that time. We developed some KPIs. Uh, I won't go into detail, but some the most important ones were uh, access, uh, vaccination, 
and um, seen to be seen by a multidisciplinary team. So we created this booklet, um, and we created some pathways and flowcharts to see how this will happen. So just quickly share some results. So we, we saw about 129 patients until I, I left. Um, 71 of them had started dialysis. Um, out of those, 40, about 39 patients out of 71 who are in the program for three months or more. So we, 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 we made these KPIs um, that patient has to be in the program for three months or more for the, for the program's effectiveness. So if they were in less than three months, it won't be uh, considered um, benefit to that. But we will still give them education. So we had two preemptive transplants during this program. Now you can argue that it, it's a, uh, within a year or so we only had two, but we previously we didn't have any uh, for, for months. And the way the system was in, in Saudi at that time, uh, it was, there were other issues rather than just um, us. We had poor PD uptake, but then there were all, all six patients who took up PD out of the 39, which was also an improvement. All patients were seen by the multidisciplinary team. Our fistula rates improved significantly. Our target was 60%. We got stuck at around 40, 41% because one of the vascular surgeons left. Um, and uh, so that really impacted us. However, it was a significant improvement from 5 to 6% to about 40 to 41%. Our hepatitis B vaccination before starting dialysis improved significantly. Our hemoglobins also improved significantly. And as I said, patients started to have much more quicker workup for transplantation uh, as we had before. The most important thing which happened also was that our crash landers significantly reduced. So the VASC, the, our renal nurse, we will follow those patients who were really progressing very closely and we will start them on time. They had a fistula made, we'll start them on time before they will uh, end up in emergency and starting as crash landers. So that's significantly improved. So what we did was that we thought, okay, let's do some um, questionnaire with the patients. How did their uh, what was their level of education before and after the education program? That was interesting. This is unpublished data. We, we're working on the manuscript. So the interesting thing was that the, so we, what we did was that we did, we did a pre-education questionnaire. We did a post-education, which was immediately after, and then we did about six, about four to 12 weeks after. So the interesting thing was that it improved significantly the level of education knowledge However, later on, it just almost came back to baseline after a few weeks, which gave us an idea that perhaps patients need more education sessions rather than just one, considering that if you look at, we also look at the literacy rate, and 48% of the patients could not read or write, so it was a very low health, you know, low literacy rate, and 24% only had primary school education, so it was a very low, um, uh, you know, the education level was very low, but this was interesting data. So uh, we uh, achieved significant improvement with multidisciplinary care uh, in, in our program. Now there are barriers. It's not a, like all smooth sailing. It's saying easy, but there are always barriers. Health literacy, family support. Sometimes patients had to bring you know, the travel cost to the bringing to patients and the family to the hospital. The other thing is patient resists the idea. And as we heard earlier on, CKD in most cases is asymptomatic. So they will say, why this whole fuss about all this? I'm, I'm happy. I don't have any symptoms. Why are you, you know, talking about all this? So it's, it's trying to just inform and educate the patient why all this is important. There are cultural or religious beliefs. Sometimes some patients have psychological beliefs. So it, it, it's not always straightforward to develop this program, but I think with education it, it can be done. So how can it be related to Pakistan? I think it, it, multidisciplinary care is extreme, can, can really be very useful in Pakistan. We have low health literacy. We have high prevalence of CKD with diabetes and hypertension, high cost of end-stage renal disease. We have late presentations and crash landers. Many patients start hemodialysis with a temporary catheter, and then I've seen patients continuing with temporary catheter. Um, low uptake of PD, vaccination rates are low, and I think it can have cost benefits. Even though if the, if the government is paying for, for hemodialysis, if we can reduce all those patients and reduce other costs, it will be less cost to the government as well. So in conclusion, um, management of CKD and end-stage renal failure is just not about dialysis. 
or transplant. It involves a lot of effort to provide best care to patients with advanced kidney disease. And multidisciplinary care provides a better coordinated care between multiple disciplines involved in complex management of these patients with progressive CKD. And multidisciplinary care is associated with better patient awareness about their disease and preparedness for renal replacement therapy. And, and I think from the studies we've shown and from other, um, our, our personal own uh, uh, observations, it can lead to improved health outcomes uh, during transition from CKD4 to 5 and even beyond. And we presented this project in the um, IHI conference in, in uh, a few years ago, and uh, we got um, awarded a, a best presentation or best project award there as well. So with this, um, I'd like to thank you um, for your attention. And uh, also, I'll take this opportunity to invite you to World Congress of Nephrology uh, in Abu Dhabi next year. And um, hope to see you there, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, management of CKD patients is indeed extremely complex. I think the US trained physicians know about this ABIM led practice performance improvement module, and they had like 150 parameters that physicians and nephrologists were supposed to take care of. And I think this is where AI will help us, and deep learning will help us because it will automate a lot of these issues like hemoglobin, phosphorus, acidosis control, even to some extent volume control. Uh, I think we have time for one question. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Wasim. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the health-related quality of life measures, did you actually measure some um, outcomes in terms of, uh, you know, some validated measures for these uh, patients after, before and after the MDT program was, was established it's to show that you actually, uh, you know, improve the quality of life, at least in terms of patient reported outcomes? I think it's a very important question. Actually, I didn't show the data because of lack of time, but there are studies who have, which have looked at it, and there are some models as well, which show that there is significant improvement uh, in this as well. Actually, there's some recent paper, I think just last year, which showed that there was a significant improvement in, in quality of life. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to, whatever you do to train the patient, record all those lectures and everything and put it on some sort of YouTube, not having the patient in the picture, but in the Pakistan cannot afford to have customized training sessions, but knowledge in YouTube age could be free. Is that something possible? Yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Actually, we, we created that booklet, and that booklet was in English as well as in, then we translated it in Arabic, and so I have, uh, I don't have any copyrights for that, so I can share it with you as well. And that can be translated in Urdu as well. Um, so I think it, it's a very comprehensive in terms of all types of PD, um, about transplantation. Um, it's about, it also includes some of the common medication we use, for example, the anemia, the vitamin D, the bicarb, and all that, and then they're also giving reasons why the patient needs to take that. Because I think it's important, unless you tell the patient why they need to take it, the compliance will be uh, low. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasim. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Peter Hill. He is a consultant nephrologist and honorary senior lecturer, clinical lead of nephrology for CKD and low clearance, Imperial College Healthcare, NHS Trust, Imperial College London. He is going to talk about an update on polycystic kidney disease. Dr. Peter Hill. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to the PSN today. It's, I'm very pleased to come here uh, to give a couple of talks and to hear about the experiences that I've uh, developed uh, uh, in, at this hospital in West London called the Hammersmith uh, Hospital. Um, these are my disclosures. Now, polycystic kidney disease is the most common single, ge single gene 
um, condition that affects the kidneys. And the incidence is between 400 and 1,000 and live births. I was trying to find out if there was, a, if there was data for the, for the incidence in Pakistan, but I'm afraid I couldn't work that out uh, from my literature searches. There are two genes that drive polycystic kidney disease, PKD1, which is on chromosome 16, and that accounts for about 85% of cases, and PKD2 that is on chromosome 4 and, is about the, is, and takes up the remaining 15%. We all know the clinical presentation of this condition. It can present in a variety of ways, in particular young patients presenting with hypertension or blood in their urine, perhaps with proteinuria or with a new end-stage renal failure. But in many patients, there's a family history of renal disease, and that's quite, um, and that's quite useful in when, uh, when thinking about screening. And we'll come on to part of the role of screening towards the end uh, to, as part of this talk today. Now, it's not just the kidneys that are affected in polycystic kidney disease. Cysts are found throughout the body, in particularly the liver, and in some patients, the pancreas. And the liver cysts can be a real challenge, particularly in women. And I have a number of patients in my PKD clinic where liver cysts actually are the predominant problem, even though they're known to have a variation in the PKD1 gene itself. And it's likely that, the, uh, that, that uh, estrogen has a role as an epigenetic phenomenon in the presentation of PKD. Now, in, these, in, these, in most situations, the, the diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease is quite secure. And in this, in this CT scan, multiple uh, cysts are seen, sorry, in this scan, multiple cysts are seen throughout the, the uh, kidney. And if, and if this patient were to have a kidney removed, say to make room for a transplant or to treat an infection, they're often the size of an American football or a rugby ball, sort of reaching up to 25 to 30 centimeters in many cases. And it's quite astonishing to think that you could be carrying around a 10 to 15 kilogram mass in your abdomen. And in many, and in many cases, they have reasonably preserved GFRs despite such profound anatomical changes. There are, there are some life-threatening associations with polycystic kidney disease that we're aware of. Berry aneurysms, you can see here in this angiogram of, a, of, the, of, the, uh, of the cerebral circulation, there's an outpouching of blood vessels uh, in keeping with a berry aneurysm. This appears to be, uh, this, uh, this affects about 5% of, of the younger population and maybe up to 20% in the older population with polycystic kidney disease. And screening of these is quite challenging, and exactly what to do varies from country to country. The, the, uh, the PKD charity with, and, uh, and, and with work in the UK is suggesting that we should be really screening patients who we think are high risk, i.e. those with a previous uh, family history or known to have a previous rupture. And that can be done with MRA screenings, that's MR angiography, at a three to five year interval. I think that there are certain high risk uh, populations, say like a b becoming a pilot, or uh, that, might, uh, that might mean that you would want to think about screening if you, if you have a patient with, the, with PKD and that's their work. And, there's a, and there are some controversies about whether one should be doing this prior to transplantation or prior to anticoagulation. Rarer complications are cardiac disease, in particular mitral valve and aortic regurge, and, uh, and diverticulitis, diverticular disease and diverticulitis are, associated, are associations too. So quite a, quite a mixed bag, although the predominant uh, presentation is of, uh, is of kidney complications, in particular urosepsis, hematuria, and, and, uh, and sadly, end-stage renal failure. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time about talking about the genes, because I think that, the, that in future, like AI that we've heard about this afternoon, understanding how the gene uh, translates into clinical practice will, be, will, be increasingly import, will become increasingly important. 
And the aim in, uh, in the UK is to embed genetics into everyday clinical practice. So when you're seeing a patient with a potential chronic kidney disease that could be genetic in, in, in its origin, the interested nephrologist who's had genetic education from, from their consultant genetic uh, colleagues can offer genetic counseling, put the phenotype together, and then send appropriate testing. Now, the PKD1 gene is a particularly complicated gene. It's, it's massive. It's got 46 exons. The beginning part is, uh, is where most of the coding sequence is, and there's lots of duplication. And that means it's often with, with standard Sanger, Singer, Sanger sequencing can be a little hard. And it's also right next to the tumor uh, sclerosis complex gene. And that explains why there's often an association with uh, tumor sclerosis and PKD. As I said, it's a large gene, and it codes for a large protein called polycystin. And we know that it's expressed in certain, in certain areas, the renal, the renal tubal epithelial cells, but also within the hepatic bile ducts and within the pancreatic ducts. But we don't know exactly what it does. We think it's involved in cell-to-cell -cell interactions and matrix, uh, and matrix signaling, and, it's, and we also think that it's related to tubular genesis. But exactly what polycystin one does is not completely clear, and knockout mice and other models have not really given us a, a complete answer to this. But what we do know is what we know a little bit more about PKD2, this smaller gene that's on chromosome 4. It's much smaller, but has a very similar expression. And we know that this is involved in calcium signaling and acts as an eye and channel function, really sort of uh, in, in keeping with one of these ciliopathies. And uh, when it goes wrong, it produces a phenotype that's similar to the ciliopathies. So why have I started to tell you about the variation? Well, I think that's because it's, it, they're often unique to single families, which means that genetic confirmation can be quite hard. We've been running a program in the United Kingdom called the 100,000 Genome Study, and many patients and families with polycystic kidneys have been recruited into that. And I think when that data comes out, with the, we'll have a lot more, greater understanding of the complexities of PKD and we'll be able to get to, to have much more uh, and be able to validate uh, various genet genetic variations that we've found. The variations in the gene can be, can be uh, variable. They can cause nonsense uh, variants, frame shifts, or splice site alterations, and largely something that truncates the protein production is bad for you. And that's why I think genetic testing will be increasingly important. If you can then, if you can work out which genes uh, are associated with a poor clinical prognosis, screening for those or knowing what that gene and targeting uh, medical care at those patients will become increasingly uh, useful and of clinical benefit. So, in keeping with that, there's been a score called the Pro PKD score that's been developed over the last few years that takes into consideration the genetic variant but also certain clinical situations. So if you have a gene that, is a, that has a poor prognostic association, and that's where the, the protein's been truncated, then, you are, then you're given extra points. If you have urological complications, in particular hematuria, then that procures a poor prognosis, as does hypertension, and sadly being male, it's worse for you as well. So that then it gets put into a scoring system, and this is how it comes out. If you develop, if, you are, if you've got a truncating mutation with urological complications in a man with, hy with hypertension at a young age, you really have got full house, and this is associated, this gives you a risk of progression where, where you can then target patients to be, uh, to be put into uh, specialist clinics and follow them through with either sort of seeing the low-risk patients, leaving them in primary care potentially, depending on your resource, and those with intermediate and high-risk cases being seen in specialist clinics. This certainly appears to have data from this work from, uh, from this group that published in Jason. You can see that if you, the green bar are the ones with a lower risk, with a low, lower score, have a, greater, um, have, a, have a greater probability of survival 
and not reaching end stage as opposed, as opposed to those with a high pro-PKD score. And I'm finding it helpful in my clinical practice to, to, uh, to calculate the, 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 the pro-PKD score if, we can, if I can identify a, a genetic variant. And it's quite helpful to, uh, for when, when talking to patients. In the large study, out in the large group which have done most of the genetic an analysis, which is out of the Mayo Clinic, about a third, just over a third are associated with truncating mutations, and about 30% of the, of the, slightly, better, uh, of the slight, slightly better condition of PKD2. And if you do have PKD1, then there are certain associations you're more likely to develop large kidneys, and have an increased risk of end-stage renal failure and early death. With PKD2, you tend to be starting to get renal disease in your 60s and 70s. With PKD1, it tends to be in your 40s and 50s. The other benefit of genotyping is about trying to, is, is, uh, is that patients are now understanding that with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, the disease does not need to be passed on. So if you can find a genetic mutation using IVF technology, uh, embryos can be created that do not have the abnormality in the PKD1 gene and, it, and uh, or, or the PKD2 gene, and, um, and then uh, pregnancies can continue with no genetic abnormality. And that's quite helpful also in making in patients who want to have pediatric diagnoses and also in transplantation, and uh, so you can exclude, uh, you can include patients in a family if there is no genetic variation identified. So with this, the sort of the, the pros of, of genetic testing, I think, are becoming increasingly helpful, but there are emotional and, uh, and prob problems, in particularly with predictive testing in terms of insurance. In the United Kingdom, there's a moratorium that no insurance company is allowed to use data from predictive testing to load health insurance. But I'm certain that as more people put their DNA into, ancestry, into uh, DNA databases such as Ancestry.com or uh, 23andMe, the, uh, the, use of, uh, the use of insurance claims from predictive testing that's currently out, out, uh, that's, that's outlawed in the United Kingdom will become uh, may become utilized as the actorists get, get hold of it. So one question that, uh, that I think we ought to try to answer is why is there such variability? I'm sure that many of us have had patients who have developed kidney damage at a young age, whereas other family members have, have uh, reached their 60s and 70s and have only mild CKD. And I think this is where new genetic phenomena or epigenetics or modifier genes that can, that can change the, the, uh, the penetration of or the exposure to the, to the germline mutation and then influence disease. In addition, if patients are taking toxins or develop an additional nephritis or develop pregnancy-associated illness, then, re then renal disease can also be superimposed. And that's explaining why there's such variability. So going back to the gene, if we know that, that polycystin 1 or 2 don't, uh, well, polycystin 1 in particular doesn't have a clear role, how on earth are we going to work out what, uh, how to treat this condition? Well, that's where we're then working out with biological science what else is happening within the kidney itself. And there are two or three pathways that I think are in, that, that we should highlight. That once you have an abnormality in PKD1, you then go on and develop abnormalities in cyclic AMP, but also the mTOR program in some, and, uh, and, to, and to also glucose metabolism. And, that, and this is where many of our novel treatments have come by understanding the sort of these cellular pathways that cause cyst development. So what can we do? Let's think about this in terms of a, in terms of a clinical application. Well, there are only, I think there are only a few interventions that, 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 that are available for patients with CKD now. And I think the most important one is probably early intervention with hypertension. Now, the HALT data that came out five years ago, there was HALT A in early chronic kidney disease, in polycystic kidney disease, and in HALT B, which was in, in CKD3, there was an attempt to see whether or not very aggressive blood pressure control would be helpful. 
in the Holt A study that looked at 1,000 patients, blood pressure control using uh, down to 90 to a systolic of around 100 was achieved. And there were some, some benefits in terms of sort of they had less albinemia, their left ventricular mass was better, but they had no change in the rate of decline in the estimated GFR, and the incidence of hyperkalemia was a problem. In the, uh, in the Holt B uh, series, there was no difference to using, to using a dual uh, ACE and ARBs. Uh, in, in the management of, uh, of, of hypertension in CKD, but it was helpful, uh, and there was an association with hyperkalemia again, but it certainly has set the uh, precedent that largely ACE inhibitors are the first line therapy for patients with, 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 with PKD. So what's the next step? And I think that's where we're learning about this now with the, in terms of treatments that can slow cyst growth, and there are lots of areas where there, there has been uh, intervention for this. So we know from the CRISP data from the, from the Mayo Clinic that if we follow cyst growth in the blue line here, as with time, there's an increased risk of, uh, sorry, there's an increased uh, rate of cyst growth. There is a decline in GFR. And the cyst growth, as you can see around here, predates the decline in the GFR. And I think this is where, this is where we're starting to, to really put out the efforts in, in, into, uh, into management. And that's trying to get interventions in early prior to the drop of GFR because the pathology has already caused uh, ischemic and, uh, and fibrotic change within the kidney once we're on that slope. Sorry, it's point is not quite coming up. The size of the kidney is also important. We know that from the Mayo data that the larger the kidneys, the worse the, worse the prognosis. So clearly we need to be targeting cyst intervention, I think, based on this observational data from, from the cohorts, from, the, from these large databases. And what the Mayo Clinic has done is they've, they've, they have such a large group of, uh, of patients and they have serial MRs, they've been able to, to type the, uh, they've been able to sort of subclass and type the uh, conditions based on, on uh, total kidney volume on MRI scan. And I think to take Dr. Ahmed's presentation, I think earlier with AI, I can tell you that my radiologist rarely can tell you a, uh, a cyst size or cyst volume, and AI is much better. And I think that when we can automate this, it'll be great, because I can get an automated MR scan told, telling me the volume that puts them into the group that comes into me, and I can then put it into the either into the Mayo database or at least interpret in a way that I think that would be helpful to in clinical application. But our problem with this is that we've got to we've got to disconnect between cyst growth and cysts rather than GFR. We haven't got a great deal of data to show that that we're going to be doing much in terms of GFR because most of our interventions are to be done quite late. So what we have done, but we have got two RCTs, both of which have been quite helpful, and I think, uh, I think we're now coming over the barriers of using, uh, of using cyst size to, uh, to make interventions. So the first one was the TEMPO study uh, with Tolvaptan, and uh, this was a randomized study. Uh, on a two-to-one basis, patients were randomized to Tolvaptan or placebo. And what we found in this study was that there was a, uh, that there was a slowing of, uh, there was an improvement in terms of cyst growth. So that there was a much, there was a much lower rate, sorry, there was a lower rate of cyst growth. And uh, when one actually looked at, the, uh, looked at the change in GFR, there was a non-significant reduction in the, uh, in the rate of, uh, of progression. It seemed to slow decline from 3.7 mils per minute a year to 2.7. But if any of you use Tolvaptan will know it has a profound effect. It blocks cyclic A, it's, it blocks vasopressin, and therefore you get a profound diuretic effect because it blocks, because vasopressin is also known as antidiuretic hormone. And patients who take the drug will typically be taking, will be ta typically drinking three to four liters of water a day. Not five or six, some patients do, but most, most in, in the clinical practice that, uh, that I'm seeing with Tolvaptan, they're drinking about three to four liters. 
And what they've, in, because of that, the placebo group were asked to drink plenty of water, and that may have influenced the results. But there was a reduction in one mil per minute. There were also some associations with liver enzymes, uh, abnormalities, and, and problems with sodium. And as a result of that, regulation and prescriptions of tolvaptan require monthly blood tests. And therefore, you're medicalizing patients with uh, who are taking a drug speculative, speculatively at this time. A second study, which was which was put together in order to get uh, regulatory approval in the United States is the reprise data, and again showed an improvement in the, uh, in the in slowing change in kidney function. So it doesn't stop decline. You're still losing two mils per minute per year in the, uh, in the, in the tolvaptan treated group, but it slowed it compared to 3.61. I think that's where the, uh, that's where, uh, the, the potential benefits are. So with that data, the, the drug tolvaptan has been approved in the UK for the use in early chronic kidney disease from polycystic kidneys. And, I've, and, uh, and we decided in West London to put one polycystic kidney clinic in the center where there's the blue H. And you can see the number of hospitals that feed into our sector. And that takes about a quarter of London's population. Now, in order to do this, there had to be an interested clinician. I happened to have a doctorate in, um, in genetic kidney disease, so I, got the, I was quite keen to take it on. And I took your multidisciplinary approach. We used a clinical nurse specialist who wanted to give CKD management, a pharmacist who could prescribe, and we had access to backup from the genetics team in order to offer genetic counseling and access for PGD if it was required. This meant that we promoted it in grand rounds. We used their charities to give a liaison and had education day. And we used a patient education seminar called Save Your Kidneys. And with this, we then, we then pulled in patients with adult polycystic kidney disease from all of those other centers who are now coming into the center uh, for treatment. And they, and they have formed their own peer group. They've formed their own Facebook chat group and they all sit in the Friday morning clinic chatting to each other about PKD interventions and what we can do. It has made us uh, really think about other interventions, in particular management of pain. The specialist clinic has also meant that I can take in other aspects of PKD, looking at kidney size and suitability for transplantation, a good family history for aneurysms, making sure patients are educated about the prompt treatment for urosepsis, and pain review. Interestingly, pain is something as those kidneys get uh, grow is, is increasingly problematic. And many patients have asked for uh, referrals to alternative treatments such as Reiki and, uh, and the Alexander Technique, which have been much better uh, compared to me dolling out um, analgesias. We've also been able to educate our radiologists in kidney volume assessments, and it's been extremely helpful for a peer group. So I think with time running out. This used to be a very, uh, this is the House of Parliament in London that used to be, used to be looked on around the world as being, um, ra we're rather proud of. I don't think we are in uh, 2019, but hopefully it will come back next year. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hill, for your update on polycystic kidney disease. Uh, it's a one of a dreadful disease. I have families uh, who have got polycystic kidney disease. Their grandparents died of polycystic kidneys. Their parents died of poly kidney, polycystic kidney disease. And now when their children come to me, they have only one question. Do we have any treatment in near future for polycystic kidney disease? I think the, I think the short answer to that question is, is there, any, is there any magic bullet for PKD? I think it's no. I don't think tolvaptan is going to be the answer, I th but I think looking after p patients with genetic disease, that question needs, that's all we've got right now. So I think it's going to, and if that means that you can actually get a patient into your clinic, talking about transplantation, doing all those things in the MDT, because they're coming monthly, you can actually get the pre-transplant conversations in very gently, and that's very helpful. 
you get to look at all of the th all get all of that pathophysiology of kidney disease sorted because you're doing a little bit of each month as well as as well as counseling for tolvaptan i think that i think i'm quite in, i'm quite in taken that how many p patients are requesting pgd i've out of the 70 uh, patients that are sorry out of the 40 patients that are on tolvaptan in my clinic I've had four that have asked for, for PGD this year. So I think as that becomes more, um, more acceptable that, and we can identify the variants, I think that may be something that allows the next generation to say, I'm not going to let this affect me. And have you experienced any liver toxicity? Liver, liver complications of tolvaptan. Um, I've seen one patient who've had a temporary rise in his, uh, in, in his um, uh, LFTs, but it was related to alcohol, not from, uh, not from Tovaptan. So not in, the, not in the population that I'm seeing. And we've got a very um, mixed population. So it's South Asian, Asian, uh, Northern European, and Afro-Caribbean genetic heritage. It's quite mixed in West London. We have a lot of hepatitis C patients here, and you know, it's, it's I think, we, I'm sure we have patients who have both uh, polycystic kidney and C. Do you have any experience of using tolvaptan in patients who have hepatitis C? Um, I haven't used it in patients with hepatitis C, but I, I think if you were, I think if you were, uh, a, as long as there were no clear, con no progressive changes of, uh, of, of, say, cirrhosis on ultrasound scan, and you could, you could follow them, that you could always stop it. The, the changes in tolvaptan are temporary. Sorry. We have to conclude the session for today. Thank you very much. We have another. Now we'll proceed. Uh, now we'll proceed with the slide presentation, the uh, shield presentation. I'll request Dr. Abira to kindly uh, come over on the stage. Or Uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Basim to kindly come over and receive his shield. And uh, now I'll request uh, Dr. Peter Hill to come over and receive his shield. Since we are privileged to have Professor Azaz Mand with us, uh, I would request him to come over and present the shield to Dr. Abira. Uh, sir, uh, can you please stay? Uh, I'll request Dr. Zahid Beg to come over and receive his shield from Professor Azaz. And now uh, uh, Dr. Amir Azhar will come over and 
receive his shield from Professor Azaz. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this session. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dr. Muhammad Amir. I'm nephrologist at Shalamar Hospital, Lahore. This session is on hypertension. I would request Professor Vakar Kazmi uh, Professor Vakar Kazmi, nephrologist in Karachi. Sir, uh, please come to the come on stage. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Kamwar Navid, head of nephrology department, Liaquat National Hospital, Karachi. Sir, please come on the stage. No, I request from uh, my worthy chair and co-chair, uh, so please introduce and invite our speaker of this session. Okay, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and I'm find myself very privileged to start this session of uh, on hypertension and Professor Kawan Navid is, uh, is also with me and uh, I would like now like to request uh, Professor Itzad Man to come on the stage to give us a talk on managing resistant hypertension and hypertensive emergencies. Uh, I am very uh, privileged to know Professor Azazman for a long time. He's a very eminent uh, nephrologist of the country, professor of nephrology, and an excellent speaker. So over to Professor Azazman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Co-Chairman. It is really a privilege and honor to be here and speaking to a huge gathering in this hall. Uh, this is uh, not a kind of research talk. It is more of a basic talk, how to manage resistant hypertension and the hypertensive emergency. There are two topics which I have to cover in 20 minutes. So I'll just try to be very brief to basic things. I will start my presentation with this uh, case presentation the 46 years old lady presents in the ER with altered state of consciousness and having a blood pressure of 200 over 120. This is a real case. This is not from a book. She was treated with IV labetalol and her condition stabilized. And then she was sent home. She was a known case of hypertension since last 15 years and blood pressure was controlled with three antihypertensive drugs. On further inquiry, it was found that she had four pregnancies, all of which were plagued with episodes of uncontrolled hypertension. Each time it was managed with IV labetalol and hydralazine. Her first three pregnancies went through with difficulty, but she lost the twin pregnancy the fourth time. Both the babies in her belly expired. And now the patient's workup was started. And her basic investigations, fundoscopy revealed hypertensive changes. She was hypertensive for the last 15 years. 
rest of the initial examination and labs were unremarkable and included RFTs, el serum electrolytes, Doppler of kidneys, urinalysis, urine for VMA, aldosterone, renin ratios, thyroid function. ECG and echo done in ER showed that she had an LVH and the ejection fraction was more than 65%. She was taking a tenolol, amlodipine, velsartan, and hydrochlorothiazide. So she was discharged from the ER on an oral four antihypertensives and labeled resistant hypertension. So the patient presented in the OPD to a nephrologist for the second opinion, and her blood pressure was still recorded at 200 over 100. Now this nephrologist checked her blood pressure in the lower limb and he found that the blood pressure was 130 by 90 in the right leg. So he asked for, the echo had already been done, so he asked for a CT autogram and a coronary angiogram. And this is the, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, angiogram, and these are the enlarged intercostal right internal memory and left internal memory arteries. The report showed that there was a coarctation of aorta after the left subclavian and the aortic segment before was 12.5 at the level of coarctation was 4.4 and after the coarctation was 16 millimeters. She had both dilated right and left internal memories and intercostal vessels which were prominent. As you can see, there is a coarctation present there. So she was successfully stented by an aortic uh, stent and her blood pressure stabilized which was in the range of 200s in the past. Now you see, this is a lady, young woman, who was in all 15 years, four times became pregnant. She had a blood pressure every time shooting up. She was on antihypertensives. And nobody ever checked the blood pressure in the lower limb, except for a nephrologist who checked it after 15 years. Luckily, in these 15 years, she, her kidney function was still saved. So that is the importance of labeling a patient resistant hypertension and not looking at the cause of hypertension. So from that I move on to the basic definitions. You're all familiar, normal, elevated, high blood pressure, and hypertensive crisis when the blood pressure is more than 180 over 120. So blood pressure as defined by the AHA guidelines is that it remains resistant hypertension when it remains above the goal in spite of three concurrent antihypertensive agents of different class and out of which one should be a diuretic. And then the patient is controlled with four or more drugs is considered a resistant hypertension. But there are certain assessment requirements before you label that patient resistant. That is, you confirm the accuracy of blood pressure out of office measurements, and you confirm adherence to a healthy lifestyle, and you confirm discontinuation of substances that can increase blood pressure, and recognize and address the hypervolemic state that may be uh, not enough to produce edema, but it may still be there. And consider the evaluation for secondary causes if it is highly suspected. So the resistant hypertension is not that uncommon. Two to 42 percent uh, people may have, uh, it's quite variable because of various uh, uh, ethnic uh, and geographic uh, variability. And in a, in, a, in a general population, it could be estimated to be about two to 10 percent. And the Nahans uh, data showed 11.8% resistant hypertension. All had trials showed 12.7% resistant hypertension. And this big study, 46,000, uh, 4,68,000 patients, 32% uh, 
uh, were having resistant hypertension, but they were not prescribed optimal treatment. So in comparison with hypertension patients, if you look at these resistant hypertension patients, 48% had diabetes as compared to those with controlled blood pressure, and 45% had CKD, or 41% had ISD and cardiovascular disease, 60, cerebrovascular disease in 16%. Um, uh, so that shows that uh, the, there are greater chances of having these problems if you are once diagnosed with resistant hypertension. And this increases the risk uh, of target organ damage. The CRIC study, the chronic uh, renal insufficiency study, it showed cardiovascular 38 and renal 28 uh, risk. Uh, but uh, when they looked at the other multivariable and things, the men, the black race, the larger waist circumference, diabetes, MI stroke, all these were strongly associated with the resistant hypertension. But as nephrologists, when we look at resistant hypertension, see that what is the link with the GFR. So the, as the GFR falls to below 45, the risk is more than 33%. And the, it is also directly correlated to the albumin uh, creatinine ratio. The higher the ratio, the higher is the risk of having resistant hypertension. So this is a list of medicines which are used uh, and uh, which can increase the blood pressure. And amongst these, we cannot forget calcineurin inhibitors, erythropoietin, uh, the use of um, steroids, NSAIDs, etc. And certain stimulants and sympathomimetic agents. Only last week I found a patient came with very high blood pressure. He was taking four drugs and he said, my blood pressure is not controlled. And the only thing he mentioned that I've got a severe allergic rhinitis and I take every hour I take uh, nasal drops and sprays to keep my nose patent. So that was a huge amount of nasal decongestant he was using which was not allowing his blood pressure to be controlled. Certain habit forming drugs. And then once we talk about resistant hypertension, we must rule out renal artery stenosis as nephrologists because unless there is proteinuria or there is increase in creatinine, a physician would not refer a case of resistant hypertension to you because they don't consider mostly renal artery stenosis. It's only the nephrologists who think uh, about it seriously more than other people. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is also a relatively less uh, suspected disease Many a times it is this which you, if you correct obstructive sleep apnea, the resistant hypertension goes away. High aldo renin ratios, Cushing's, mineralocorticoid excess, Liddell syndrome, which is excessive epithelial sodium channel, ENAC activity causing increased sodium absorption, or uh, Gordon syndrome, which is basically a type two hypo uh, adrenalism or hypo Para, uh, hypo, what do you call, uh, adrenalism, um, leading to Gordon syndrome. And there is uh, pheochromocytoma, thyroid disorder, and the last one, I just described the case to you, who was undiagnosed for 15 years. So there is a stepwise approach to resistant hypertension, that if the patient is on more than three drugs, uh, well, you have to make sure that the blood pressure readings are accurate. And then you ask for lifestyle modification. And you look at the compliance. And drugs which raise the blood pressure, you must exclude. And you may add a diuretic and look for secondary causes. If this is not there, you go back to ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And if lifestyle modification is not helping, ensure salt uh, intake to be a major factor. Only a few years ago, in the American Society of Hypertension meeting in the US, the president of the American Society of Hypertension presented a case which was referred to him as resistant hypertension. And he admitted the patient and looked at the urinary sodium. And a patient who was on five drugs after salt was excluded from the diet, his blood pressure came down to uh, normal. 
and from five drugs that patient came down to one drug for the control of blood pressure. So I think the salt intake part is still underlooked or overlooked as a cause because this case was presented by the president of the American Society of Hypertension, USA. Um, we have to look at that the drugs the patient is taking, is they are optimized, diuretic is added, and if this doesn't happen, you do work up for secondary hypertension. So what is the treatment of resistant hypertension? You stop the medications that raise the blood pressure, identify secondary hypertension, and look at the out-of-office blood pressure monitoring to exclude white coat hypertension. And now ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is a very useful tool. Uh, so there is a norm pharmacological therapy, there is a pharmacological therapy, and there are certain interventions. The ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the patients, you can divide them into four kind of patients with ambulatory blood pressure readings. And if you look at if the daytime blood pressure at ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is less than 135 or 185 and nighttime less than 120 by 70, it's called controlled hypertension. And if it is masked hypertension when it is high, but with the doctor it is not there, or true hypertension when it is high at home and also recorded in the office, and then white coat hypertension when it is high in the office, but normal at home. So what do you do if it is well controlled, well you repeat the amb ambulatory blood pressure monitoring yearly. If it is one of these situations, you intensify the treatment, or you may add an aldosterone antagonist, or add a bedtime antihypertensive, and repeat the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring after every intervention that you do. If it is white coat, if it is true hypertension, you again intensify. If it is white coat hypertension, then you look at the systolic blood pressure if it is more than 15 or 115 or daytime less than 115, you may repeat it six monthly or yearly. So lifestyle modifications for resistant hypertension or for any hypertension. There is hardly any money in disease prevention. Most of the people go for surgery pills to reduce blood pressure. Weight loss, healthy diet, reduced intake of sodium, enhanced intake of potassium, all these have significant effects on the blood pressure. And you can see these, even in the normotensive people, these changes do take place. Physical activity, aerobic, dynamic, or isometric exercises, they reduce the blood pressure significantly. And uh, weight loss, as you will see, is linked for every one millimeter drop and you expect one kg reduction in the weight loss. So if somebody loses 10 kg, his systolic blood pressure may come down by 10. So what should be the choice of regimen for resistant hypertension? Well, of course, you have to individualize the treatment according to the, and as Lara, Dr. Lara's theory uh, R hypertension and V hypertension. He says that there are only two types of hypertension, the renin mediated and volume mediated. So he calls them R hypertension and V hypertension. So the uh, drug of choice of mostly ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, as most of the guidelines, uh, you know, in indicate or calcium channel blockers or a long acting thiazide diuretic. And if the blood pressure is still uncontrolled, you may consider to add uh, spironolactone and titrate to 50, but of course it is difficult in CKD patients to do that because of the risk of hyperkalemia. And uh, still if it is not controlled, then you may add a beta blocker or labetalol or, you know, a centrally acting or a vasodilatrous to this. Now the, typically the volume expansion, which is part of the resistant hypertension, is typically not sufficient to produce edema, and that is why the, the BNP levels which are higher in the patients with resistant hypertension, they, you, when you add a diuretic, they, it gets better. But for people with GFR which is less than 30, you may need to use a loop diuretic like most of the CKD patients. Apart from metolazone which acts better 
even with uh, uh, chronic renal insufficiency. And this I have already talked about. Then certain interventions, uh, the renal denervation, the uh, baroreceptor, baroreflex activation, carotid body ablation, and uh, renal artery stenting, all these, uh, this is the simplicity catheter to denervate the renal vessels and therefore cause a reduction in the blood pressure. It acts through various mechanisms, by natriuresis, by reducing the norepinephrine release, and by lowering the renin activity and decreasing the afferent signaling to the sympathetic activation. And then the Rios device, which is basically to stimulate the baroreceptors may be useful in patients who cannot take medication. And then central arteriovenous anastomosis, which uh, has, uh, as you can see, that before the procedure, uh, the blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, and reduction, which is found statistically significant, but there are risks of venous stenosis. From that, I move on to the, the uh, hypertensive emergencies. And again, hypertensive emergencies, we divide them into two, the H, hypertension E and hypertension U. The hypertension E is the, when the blood pressure is raised more than 180 over 100, but there is evidence of end organ damage going on. And people, urgency when there is no end organ damage. So basically, this is a severe and abrupt increase in blood pressure, which which is impeding Im the, uh, the progress, progressive end organ damage, impending uh, end organ damage. And patients with uh, hypertension E, uh, they require hospitalization and prompt treatment and close monitoring. And patients with hypertension U can be safely managed in OPD, I mean, without, uh, if they have target organ damage already like LVH or CKD, then you have to deal with them differently. So here I talk about a uh, few cases. Let's say there are five patients who come to you. All of them have a blood pressure more than 180 over 120. The patient A has nausea, vomiting and confusion. B has, sh is short of breath, spitting sputum, pink sputum and having chest pain. Patient C is having sharp tearing, chest pain and back pain. And patient D is one with six hours history of right-sided weakness, and patient E has headache and is concerned about his hypertension. So we look at these different scenarios in patients with 180 over 120 and who fall in the hypertensive urgency or in the emergency. So this patient, first patient, is actually having hypertensive encephalopathy because he has confusion and uh, there is a presentation of end organ damage and cerebral autoregulation is overwhelmed and is leading to vasodilatation, edema, and increased intracranial pressure. The patient can even have seizures. So it presents with headache, visual changes. So, so the drug of choice with such a patient would be IV labetrolol in the form of a bolus. And the target is to reduce the mean arterial pressure not more than 20 to 25 percent uh, in the first two to eight hours. But vasodilators like sodium nitroprusside or hydralazine, they have a risk of producing intracranial shunting. The second patient is a patient with pink sputum and chest pain, and he has acute pulmonary edema, and this type of patient has gallop and crackles, and these patients require urgent treatment, and of course, patient, uh, these patients may be treated with nitroglycerin infusion or with uh, labetrolol if they are not in failure or with an elapril or sublingual captopril. And again, the target is to reduce the mean arterial pressure by 20 to 25 percent. The third patient who had pain radiating to the back, tearing type of pain, has aortic dissection. And this dissection uh, requires urgent treatment. And of course, the drug of choice in this situation is nitroprusside or esmolol or labetrolol and hydralazine is contraindicated in this kind of situation cause reflex tachycardia. The last patient, the fourth patient is having a CVA because he has weakness of right side. And both in embolic and uh, hemorrhagic stroke, the, it is essential to maintain the adequate cerebral blood flow 
And if it is uh, embolic, you try to bring it down from 220 to 180 or 100. And if it is an, um, uh, a hemorrhagic stroke, then you bring it down to less than 180 over 105 and not lower it to too low. Uh, patient E has mild headache and there is evidence of, uh, no evidence of end organ damage, he's just concerned he can be managed in the OPD uh, because these chronically hypertensive patients, they tolerate the mean uh, arterial pressure better. So um, if we look at these factors, which one do you think is the primary reason for hypertensive emergencies? It is mostly the non-adherence to the treatment, which is the cause, and we must ensure Patients uh, make, uh, you know, false statements. Blood pressure goals of hypertensive emergency in the first hour reduced by 25%, 22 to six hours reduced to 160 or 100, 110, and six to 24 hours, 160 to um, 110, and in 24 to 48 hours goals according to the guidelines. So various oral drugs you can use in hypertensive emergencies is captopril, clonidine, and labetrolol. Doses and durations are mentioned. But if it is a pregnant woman with high blood pressure, you can use labetrolol or you can use hydralazine. But you have to keep in mind lupus syndrome with hydralazine. Nitroglycerin is typically used for patients with LVF, with coronary ischemia infarction. Sodium nitroproside for increased, uh, for, uh, again, when you rapidly need to um, lower the blood pressure in many situations. And then esmolol, metoprolol, labetrolol, more or less similar indications, in LFRL for, for left ventricular failure. And um, these are the kind of doses with the onset of duration. But I would like to mention phenaldopam, phenaldopam which is for, for renal uh, physicians, it is a highly selective uh, dopamine one receptor agonist, and it has 10 times more potency for dopamine than dopamine as a renal vasodilator. And its antihypertensive effect is by natriuresis and vasodilatory effects, and it is agent of choice in hypertension emergencies associated with renal dysfunction. And uh, it sh uh, should not be used for contrast-induced nephropathy. The use of sublingual, um, uh, this uh, nifidipine has been discouraged because its absorption is erratic. 20 years from now, we used to uh, give sublingual drops of nifidipine to control blood pressure in the ER, but it's no more available. And because it lacks documentation, and if you lower the blood pressure too rapidly, patient can collapse. So. Um, in hypertensive crisis, this is my last slide, look for presence or absence of target organ damage based on the presenting complaints, physical findings, and the labs. The goal is to reduce the blood pressure not more than 25% in first hour. And there are specific drugs for specific situations. And the goal of medication basically is to provide smooth reductions in the blood pressure, optimize blood pressure values with readily titratable agents while avoiding complications and adverse effects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Azadman. And considering the constraints of time, I would allow just one or two quick questions, and then we move over to the next speaker. One or two questions. Uh, Rajman, thank you for a very nice and comprehensive talk. Just one thing, if you can just uh, tell us a little bit that uh, how's your experience in patients who have resistant hypertension on dialysis? Well, that is a different subject altogether. I gave a talk in one of the meetings just on managing uh, hypertension in dialysis patients. I think, again, the major factor is the volume control. Right. Most of the patients are under dialyzed, most of the patients, the first step would be to bring them to their ideal body, uh, to their, uh, I mean, uh, dry weight, of, uh, and remove all the excess. 
because it is uh, volume expansion, they are anuric, most of them. And then come the beta blockers, uh, night time if they have, and then uh, so many other things we can discuss. Absolutely true. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Izadman. Uh, now I want to in invite uh, Dr. Asim Ahmed. He's a well-known nephrologist and our colleagues for the last 15 years, a very prominent name in Pakistan nephrology community. Um, he has a lot of uh, stars to his cap. Uh, he's currently a director at uh, Kidney Center. Um, he's a member of International Advisory Board, Journal of Math Ethics. He's a chairperson biomethic group at uh, Aachen University and Ziyadin University. He has multiple published papers to his name. Um, he would talk today on uh, clinical trials and hypertension guidelines. How should we approach these patients? Thank you very much, Kawar. Uh, Thanks for the introduction. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try to go through this presentation, hopefully in time. I know it's the last presentation of the second day, which is a hectic day for all of us. So my presentation, again, like Azaz, is going to have some cases initially. And I think it's just to highlight how sometimes when we decide what to treat and when to treat is as important as what we are treating it with. So that's my history. And I'll tell you why I've chosen these guidelines, because I was sort to sort talk about guidelines too and how I or we treat our patients. So let's see how, how we do, do our treatment. So this is a 43-year-old uh, male. He's evaluated during a routine uh, ex physical examination. He has no current symptoms and no past medical history. He has, uh, on physical examination, a blood pressure of 144 by 86. A repeat measurement after five minutes of rest, his blood pressure comes down to 136 by 88. His BMI is 32. The remainder of examination is normal. And labs, labs show normal glucose, normal creatinine, normal other thing else. So in addition to his lifestyle modification, what will be the most appropriate next management step? It's not an exam, and we'll do this at the end also. So I just want you to tell me how many of you choose A, how many will choose B, C, or D? So A. Please raise your hands if you think we should give him A. Nobody wants to give A. B, low dose thiazide. C, order ambulatory BP monitoring. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Check blood pressure in one year's time. So let me write it down so I remember at the end what we what decided. So we all said, most of us, nobody said anything else except for C. Okay, what about the case two? So this is a 60-year-old woman who was evaluated during a follow-up visit uh, for hypertension. She's a known hypertensive. She has, uh, uh, she has high lipids and his, her cholesterols have been high. She tolerates her medications well, but except for mild pedal edema, since starting her antihypertensive, there's no other major symptoms. She's physically active. She, her current medications are amlodipine 5 milligrams and, and a statin, robust statin that she uses. On exam, the average, blood pressure, uh, average of two blood pressure readings is 152 by 86, which is consistent with measurements she obtained at home for three months. Her heart rate is 64 minutes, beats per minute. Her BMI is 22. She has trace pedal edema. Labs show normal chemistry and urine dipstick shows no protein. So this is case two. So, uh, a known hypertensive, on amlodipine, no major symptoms, she, and on, on statin because she has high cholesterol, uh, heart rate of 64, blood pressures of 152 by 86, at home too and at home, uh, and uh, she is now with normal chemistry and blood urine there. So which of the following is the most appropriate next step? Adding lesinopril, adding metoprolol, increasing amlodipine, or continue current regime. So let's start. Adding lesinopril, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, adding metoprolol, no. Increasing amlodipine to 10 milligrams, no. 
continuing current regime? No. So this is 2 is A. Okay. The third and the last case. A 51-year-old male uh, is evaluated during a follow-up visit for management of newly diagnosed hypertension and diabetes. He started a program of lifestyle modification for his diabetes, but hasn't started antihypertensive <coughs> medications as yet. He currently takes no medication. On exam, his blood pressure is 148 by 92. His heart rate is 76. His BMI is 33. The remainder of exams are normal. Laboratory exam examination shows a creatinine of 1.5 and a potassium of 4.2. A urine dipstick with no hemoturia or proteinuria and a spot urinary protein creatinine ratio of 0.5. So, which of the following is the most appropriate medication that can be used? A, hydrochlorothiazide. No one? B, lisinopril. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, D, lisinopril plus hydrochlorothiazide. No one? Lisinopril and losartan, a dual blocker? No one. Okay, so lisinopril it is, 3B. I'm writing this down because I'm not going to remember it at the end of my presentation who said what. Okay. So uh, let's go to hypertension. We've talked about hypertension, as Az talked about it a lot. It's uh, and, and in the whole day that we've been talking about, we all know it's an epidemic uh, of non-communicable diseases, and especially because of so many changes in our lifestyle that it has become such a high prevalence of hypertension in the whole global community. The prevalence of hypertension varies across countries. Uh, the WHO African region has the highest prevalence while the WHO regions of the America has the lowest percentage. We are in between. We are the EMRO region, which is not the African or the American, but the Eastern Mediterranean region. For some odd reason, we are with the Arabs rather than the Southwest. The, the review of uh, current trends shows that a number of adults with hypertension increased from 594 millions in, in 1975 to 1 1.13 billion right now with the increase seen largely, unfortunately, in the low and middle income countries. So that there's a huge rise in overall increase in hypertension globally, but unfortunately disproportionately much higher rise in the lower and middle income country. And hypertension remains clearly a major preventable cardiovascular mortality. If you look at Pakistan, uh, whatever data that we have, um, the National Health Survey that was done showed that about 22% of urban Pakistani population over the age of 15 years and a third of those, and I think yesterday somebody said from the latest reading is, is about half of those rather than the third of those more than 50 years ha had hypertension. So huge burden. Less than 3% of hypertensive patients had their blood pressure controlled below 140-90. That's again one, I think it was from the uh, study of the National Health Survey, which I think Tazeen and others actually had looked at. And again, somebody yesterday and this morning quoted that general practitioners in Pakistan unfortunately underdiagnose hypertension and undertreat hypertension. So we have a high global incidence, high regional incidence, and also that we are unable and we do not control them that well. And I'll go very briefly of the whole trials because somebody said, what are the trials in hypertension? These are the number of trials that you will see. So you have a VA trial, 1967, VA 1970, as the uh, FP trial, and you know there are many, many earlier trials, but then comes the the in the in the 20, 2000s, you or in the 1998 and onwards, you'll see the HOT trial, the H, 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 HV, HYV, ET trial, accomplished trial, Accord trial, and the Sprint trial. I think it, this doesn't show for some reason because the last slide, the last the, the last would have been the Sprint trial. The Sprint trial, unfortunately. Uh, if you all know, has uh, looked at two values of blood pressures. And there are a lot of concern about SPRINT trial because a lot of present guidelines are based on SPRINT. And there is a big issue of the SPRINT trial uh, that uh, they used individuals in the SPRINT trial who were already on a previous antihypertensive drugs to define their level of blood pressure and injury. So there could be somebody who was already using two medications to control his blood pressure and was in their level now of the inclusion criteria versus somebody who was not using it. 
and it excluded a large population of people who were diabetics. Also, they had uh, their largest cardiovascular outcome, which showed to be very, very good, was basically based on heart failure. So their largest component that got better in the cardiovascular event was heart failure, which drove the overall cardiovascular morbidity to a much better on people who were controlled to a certain blood pressures that they, they were concerned. And also, unfortunately, their design was such that they were comparing a very large difference between um, control of blood pressure, which is very poor, versus control of blood pressure, which is very good. So everything pointed out that the treatment that they received uh, in the SPRINT trial, they uh, actually did very, very well. But this is the major concern of SPRINT trial, and I'm raising this because a lot of present guidelines, or some of the guidelines that are, that are now using this SPRINT trial as the major determinants of why, why you should treat them at what levels. Again, as I said, as I keep saying, everyone, guidelines are excellent, but they are guidelines. They are two big roads that tell you that you have to drive on this road. It doesn't tell you which, which end of the road. And if you see the plethora of guidelines, I'm not sure whether you can see, oh, you can see the slide. So there are a huge number of, of guidelines that have been published over a period of time, and I will go through some of them in the next part. The whole problem or the whole issue in hypertension is what, how you define hypertension. And, and the, if you look at the present or recent JNC 6, 7, and 8, the, the optimal or the control blood pressures are s different. So if you can, so op the, in, the, in the initial JNC criteria, the 120-80 was normal, this was normal, high normal, borderline, and then there was to be hypertensive. In the present JNC or the JNC 8 in 2014, the treatment should be initiated at 150-90, however, or higher in adults, which are more than 60 or lower for the other people. The, the ACC, 2017 ACC or American Heart Association guidelines, I won't say unfortunately, but they, they changed the goalpost, and so therefore the target or the normalcy of blood pressure became different. And so therefore, if you have now, uh, if you are now targeting people who are at 130-94 or 130-39 as stage one, the large number of people will become hypertensive. And the whole issue is that the, the criteria of hypertension or the, the, the denominators or the, the, um, the, the evidence that they got from was mainly from sprint trial. And the, the, the chair of the, the AAH and the, and the AHA guidelines were, was the, the prime investigator of the sprint trial. So the guy actually who did the sprint trial is now leading the, the guideline maker. So there is what we call is, is a kind of an academic or intellectual conflict of interest. It's not financial, it's not other things, but it is something that I produced over a period of time, so therefore it, this, that must be right. So that's the major issue with the things. There are now many more people, there are many more people now, if we actually think of this guideline, who will now become hypertensive, which at one time they were never considered as hypertensive. But if you go across the Atlantic and you look at the European guidelines, they are slightly different. Of what is normal or optimal blood pressure versus optimal versus normal versus high normal, which they still call it as high normal, and it's still not called as stage one, and then grade one, grade two, and grade three, and then isolated hypertension. Again, again it's a value of over 10 millimeters, which is different. If you look at how people treat uh, or decide to treat is about the, the in guidelines, for especially for JNC8, and there is a great uh, thing for adults and how you go through whether you're diabetic or not and how much drugs to use. Again, the starting, entire starting period, uh, the starting blood pressures are clearly higher than what normally other guidelines would suggest by about 10 millimeters. And if you look at the, the, the European guidelines, you'll see that there's a clear cut difference between when you initiate treatment and, and in which condition. These are for people who are hypertensive who have no other things. So we're not talking about people with heart failure or, or, or with CKD. And again, their, their algorithm for treatment is clearly different 
or change or slightly different from because the starting point for treating hypertension is different. The, for uncontrolled hypertension, the European guidelines would suggest that you start initially with dual therapy like most other things, and then you go through a triple regime, and you, they, they all suggest ACE inhibitor and, and, and a calcium channel blocker, or an ACE inhibitor, or, or an ARB versus calcium channel blocker, or a diuretic. So you can start with either or. But drug treatment for hypertension and chronic kidney disease, of course, is slightly different. Uh, the, the targets are slightly different, and um, in both and all guidelines, beta blockers are not considered as, as treatment for hypertension until and unless there is a specific reason you want to use beta blockers. For example, ischemic heart disease, angina, and so on and so forth. So if you go to NICE guidelines, the NICE guidelines are a good combination between the European versus the American or the American Heart Association guidelines where their initiation of treatment and other things are related to a level and their, their definition of hypertension or a, or a normal blood pressure probably is in between the, the American Heart Association versus the European guidelines. So it's a good compromise if you are, if you are, if you are concerned what to use. So everybody suggests that you use an ACE inhibitor or an ARB as, as a, one of the primary things and a thiazide diuretic or a diuretic, as, uh, as Az was pointing out, or a calcium channel blocker, and beta blocker is dangerous. If you see the solid lines, the solid lines are good combinations, and the dotted lines are a poorer combination. So, so ACE inhibitor, ARB, was, and calcium channel blocker, or calcium channel blocker, and thiazide, and this in this setting, but across usage is, is not really as good results. My, I used to use ACE inhibitor all the time, and I'm now started getting more concerned of using ACE inhibitor because if you look, uh, there's a, there was a study in BMJ uh, in 2017 which looked at a large population of patients that were prescribed ACE inhibitor or ARB for whatever reason. Again, it's not a, it's not a trial in which it's, a, it's not a uh, randomized controlled trial prospectively, but this is looking at a real life data of populations who got ACE inhibitor and ARB and they looked at them over a period of time to see. We all know, you know, all residents are told that if you have a 30% rise, more than 30% rise of serum creatinine, then you should avoid using ACE inhibitor. So they looked at what is the rise, rises. So if you look at this, this is the cumulative incidence or death, uh, cumulative incidence on using it in. And these are the lines are about the rise of, crea of creatinine uh, after using an ACE inhibitor on ARB. So even a 10% rise of, of creatinine at the initiation or whatever time you check the next time, there is, there is a clear cut change in the cumulative incidence of mortality. And if you go by the 30% rule, which is somewhere here, up to 30%, which is up to here, the cumulative incidence goes up by 30%. If you go above that, of course, it goes very, very high. So the question is, are should we actually now be looking at ACE inhibitor and ARB in a slightly different way than we've always looked at ACE inhibitor and ARB? Yes, they're very good for diabetics. With best, they're very good for where they reduce proteinuria, but would they actually have an, a, a problem in later life? Clearly, that trial is not looking at what are the things. These are actually could be people who already had a bad vascular tree, and when you use something, their creatinine went up, which is an indicator of what it is. But clearly, you have to be a little cognizant. So, my faith in ACE inhibitor ARB in the last two years has gone down a little bit, but, but it's still used. So at the last three minutes. So remember the case, case one? So the case one was a 43-year-old male um, with a BMI of 32, a slightly higher, or a pressure that was to be 144 by 86. Repeat reading was 136 by 86, and so on and so forth, normal creatinine, normal creatinine. And if I remember correctly, we all chose, you remember what we chose? We chose C. But if you look at what the guidelines would suggest, you would check D. Ambulatory BP monitoring, ambulatory BP monitorings are done for a different reason, as Azaz was putting. Not if your readings are changed and if you already know your blood pressure is not as high because your first reading is very different from thing. Lifestyle modification, of course, is there. Everything else is going to be there. So, so, so the, yes, it should be followed up with the yearly follow-up, but you really don't need to do ambulatory BT monitoring. It's not something that you have seen which has not been corroborated. 
So you've seen a blood pressure, you waited for 10 minutes, it has clearly gone down to a normal value. So you really don't need to do an ambulatory BP monitoring to see whether it falls into any other range. So our class wasn't very good in the first answer. So case two, 60 year old woman, uh, already hypertensive, already using a statin, slight pedal edema, normal, uh, normal, uh, uh, normal thing, and her blood pressure was high. Uh, and we had, were talking about what should we add. And the, I think the answer was, we had said A, and right you are. But, of course everything is right. Any diabetics, any other things who are hypertensive, ACE inhibitor may help, but as I said, now I would look at the serum creatinine in a much different values than I used to look at three years ago. I am now really concerned because a lot of our population is, is an, a hypertensive population already have a lot of vascular complications and we're not sure how, what your, their renal artery looks like or what their overall vascular tree look like. But if you are going to pass the exam, if Azaz is going to be the examiner, lisinopril is the answer. So case three that we talked about was a 50-year-old, 51-year-old man with elevated blood pressure who was diabetic, who had a high uh, creatinine of 1.5 and, and a creatinine to protein ratio of 0.5. And we had said what is the most appropriate antihypertensive treatment and we had talked about hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, lisinopril per amlodipine, lisinopril per ACT, and then lisinopril for losartan. And we had said B, and you're right again. But again, this all the recommendations are very clear. Uh, if you have diabetes, if you have proteinuria, clearly if you have diabetes and you're hypertension without proteinuria, if your blood pressure is already not controlled on one, adding, adding uh, 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 thing. The other thing that I like to tell, I think Dr. Rafa Nakhvi also said this, uh, treating them, if you are treating them with an ACE inhibitor, it really doesn't matter which ACE inhibitor you use. If you're treating them with an uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, it really doesn't matter what, what, uh, what you use. Yes, people will say Irbasartan is better. Yes, they will say Valsartan is better. The Valsartan heart failure trial ki baje se bahut sari cheeze aagayi. But by and large, it is a, unfortunately or fortunately, it's a group effect because the the price range between 50 pesos and five rupees is quite a lot. And so all sartans act similarly, all prills act similarly. So in conclusion, uh, BP epidemiology is clearly changing. We have a very high incidence. It's a very high incidence in Pakistan. We don't, at least even I, I think I'm culprit to it. We don't treat hypertension really early and we probably don't achieve targets as we should. Uh, office blood pressures, I keep saying in my clinic when they check the blood pressure, we, the blood pressure is always checked twice when they walk in and once they are seen by somebody else. And I always tell them it's still useless. I would want you to take your own blood pressure readings at home too. Because to decide that the, there's somebody's actually hypertensive or their blood pressure have changed, you really need to know what their blood pressures are, not in the office but at home. Whether you do it by ambulatory method or whether you do it by home monitoring is a, is a separate issue. Cardiovascular and, uh, and tar uh, uh, organ damages need to be clearly present because CKD, left ventricular failure, and retinopathy are the major cul culprits to this. Lifestyle modica modification, as you said, reduce weight. For each 10 kilograms, 10 millimeters systolic pressure comes down. For decreased salt intake, for each de degree of salt that goes down, and unfortunately, not only the salt that is in this, we all tend to eat a lot more salt than most people eat. Bagheer fries khaye to din nahi sakta na? And especially right now when I'm hungry. Uh, the only issue that you have to all decide is what targets to treat elderly. And elderlies have to be treated differently from rest of the population, like in all other guidelines. You really don't want an elderly person waking up at night and falling and, having a, a, and breaking a bone. So the targets are different. They're not going to live that long, so they don't have the cumulative problem. So if you're a 79-year-old with a slightly uncontrolled blood pressure in the conventional young being, they're not going to live more than 30 years. If you're a 40-year-old with blood pressure, then you are hopefully going to live more, another 40 years or 50 years, and that's going to be a cumulative risk that you have to see. Uh, diabetes and CKDs have different targets, of course, because you want to prevent their progression and their, their accumulation. Uh, diastolic pressures of 80s and less should not be uh, not really good. 
uh, there is a lot of physician, as you said, titration, but there's a lot of physician inertia of how to titrate, and there's sometimes over treatment too. So you ideally, the recommendation is start treatment with two drugs, uh, thiazide and thiazide and something else. But the, but but most and ideally, if it's in, a, in one single combination, it's it's much more easier to take. The more pills you have to take, at more times you have to take, the less likely to be the compliance. Statins and antiplatelet therapy have to be considered because you want to make sure to reduce the cardiovascular risk at the end of the day. So I thank you very much. I am just about in time. Uh, thank you, Professor Asim, for an excellent talk on hypertension, and I would welcome questions from the audience, please.